Come to order and welcome to everyone. I note that a quorum is present. The committee is meeting today to hear testimony on examining the policies and priorities of the Corporation for National and Community Service. This is entirely a remote hearing. All microphones will be kept muted as a general rule to avoid unnecessary background noise. Members and witnesses will be responsible for unmuting themselves when they are recognized to speak or when they uh, seek when they wish to seek recognition. I'll also ask members please identify themselves before they speak. Members should keep their cameras on while the while in the proceeding. Members shall be considered present in the proceeding when they are visible on camera and they will be considered not present when they are not visible on camera. The only exception to this is that experiencing technical difficulties and inform the committee staff of such difficulty. If any member experiences technical difficulty during the hearing, you should stay connected on the platform, make sure you're muted and use your phone to immediately call the committee's IT director whose number was provided in advance. Should the chair experience technical difficulties and need to step away from the um, to vote on the floor, uh, Mr. Courtney or another majority member is hereby authorized to assume the gavel in the chair's absence. This is an entirely remote hearing, and as such, the committee's hearing, hearing room is officially closed. Members who choose to sit with their individual devices in the hearing room must wear headphones to avoid background, uh, background noise, feedback, echoes, and distortion resulting for more than one person on the software platform sitting in the same room. Members are also expected to adhere to social distancing, safe healthcare guidelines, including the use of masks, hand sanitizer, and wiping down the areas before and after their presence in the hearing room. In order to ensure the committee's five-minute rule is adhered to, staff will be keeping track of uh, time using the committee's field timer. The field timer will appear in its own thumbnail picture and will be named 001's underscore timer. There'll be no one minute remaining warning. The field timer will show a blinking light when time is up. Members and witnesses are asked to wrap up promptly when their time has expired. So the committee rule HC opening statements are limited to the chair and ranking member. This allows us to hear from our witnesses sooner and provides all members with adequate time to ask questions. I now recognize myself for the purpose of making an opening statement. We are meeting to reflect on the important role of the Corporation of National and Community Service, better known as AmeriCorps, in supporting communities through service opportunities. The hearing today uh, also meets the overs our oversight responsibility, according to House rules, to examine AmeriCorps' disclaimed financial audit for fiscal year 2021. Whenever an agency receives such a report, the Committee of Jurisdiction is required to hold an oversight hearing such as the one we're holding today. And we're joined by and we welcome AmeriCorps Inspector General Deborah Jeffrey and the Acting CEO Malcolm Coles to discuss how AmeriCorps can best fulfill its vital mission. Since AmeriCorps founded, was founded in 1993, it has empowered 1 million Americans to provide critical support for the young and old in neighborhoods across the nation. After Hurricane Katrina, AmeriCorps members helped rebuild homes and neighborhoods. During the Flint water crisis, members went door to door to deliver water, water filters. Through, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, AmeriCorps has been essential in our nation's response and recovery by helping students through mentoring and, rebuild, and reading programs, fighting food insecurity, insecurity for millions of Americans, providing companionship to homebound seniors to ensure that food, healthcare, and social services were readily available, and helping to co coordinate COVID-19 vac vaccination clinics. In just the last year, members in my district helped seniors live independently and helped our youth develop literacy skills. And since its founding, over 1,900 members from my district have been mobilized, serving more than 3 million hours. National service programs not only benefit our communities, but also create a pathway to higher education for thousands of Americans. After serving, members can earn educational awards that allow them to pursue a college degree or trade certificate or pay off student debt. Since 1994, nearly 1.2 million AmeriCorps members have earned more than $4 billion in educational awards. AmeriCorps is, is, is essential for both our communities and our workforce. As a result, the national service programs have consistently received bipartisan support. 
AmeriCorps was founded under a Democratic president, received record funding levels under, Repub under a Republican-led Congress, and Presidents Bush, Obama, and Biden have all expanded AmeriCorps' capacity and reach. Despite the importance of the agency and its record bipartisan support, AmeriCorps is facing serious challenges that must be addressed for this agency to reach its full potential. We'll hear, as, we, as we'll hear today from our witnesses, AmeriCorps has failed to implement a rigorous, rigorous financial management program since 2017, which has left the agency without the tools to adequately manage grantees and discover and crack down on bad actors. The Inspector General's findings are a clear call for the agency to overhaul its accounting and grantee oversight processes. And I look forward to hearing today more about how AmeriCorps plans to address these issues. Um, modernizing and strengthening AmeriCorps' financial infrastructure is critical to ensuring the agency is carrying out its mission and delivering on, its, on behalf of its members, communities, and taxpayers. This is, <clears throat> this is, all, of, this is all the more important in light of the historic funding increase for AmeriCorps that Congress is considering as part of the Build Back Better Act. This, in, uh, this investment does include uh, funding for AmeriCorps, what AmeriCorps needs to address the management change, uh, changes identified by the Inspector General. Investments made in the AmeriCorps, investments we make in AmeriCorps uh, deliver tangible returns for the taxpayers. We have found that for every $1 that America invests in AmeriCorps and senior core programs, uh, more than $17 is returned to communities, service members, and the federal government. And we look forward to hearing how AmeriCorps plans to work with our committee to ensure that these investments are paired with robust improvements to address the agency's ongoing management challenges and a strong continuing, with strong continuing oversight. At a time when at a time of deep division across the country, the AmeriCorps mission of bringing Americans together to serve communities is more important now than ever. So I want to thank uh, Ms. Jeffrey and Mr. Cole for your work and the opportunity to discuss how we can improve the agency and best leverage AmeriCorps to save our nation, to, ser to serve our nation. Now I yield, um, now I yield to the distinguished ranking member from North Carolina, Dr. Fox, for the purpose of an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We are here today because AmeriCorps, formerly known as the Corporation for National Community Service, CNCS, has failed yet another audit. After holding numerous oversight hearings on the fiscal state of AmeriCorps, it's time to admit that this is a failed experiment. AmeriCorps has been given years to get its act together, but has failed to fix its systemic failures. How long are we going to ask taxpayers to prop up this broken agency? AmeriCorps oversees the community service activities of more than eight different federal programs and initiatives, primarily by managing the distribution of grants. Yet AmeriCorps has proven repeatedly does not have the ability or the systems in place to do this effectively. This agency is entrusted with nearly a billion dollars of taxpayer funds every year. One of the most important duties of this committee is to provide oversight over federal agencies like AmeriCorps. This work is even more critical when the agency proves it cannot police itself. At every turn and under multiple administrations, AmeriCorps has failed at its attempts at oversight, transparency, and reform. AmeriCorps' own Office of Inspector General has issued numerous reports detailing the agency's failure to fulfill its mission to safeguard the taxpayer funds entrusted to it. These reports have noted patterns of fraud, mismanagement, noncompliance, and safety hazards within AmeriCorps grantees. AmeriCorps has been plagued by poor management and weak financial oversight since it began in 1993. Despite repeated demands from Congress to improve its management and get its fiscal house in order, AmeriCorps has failed to deliver. We know AmeriCorps has failed at following the law for a long time. For example, from 2013 to 2015, members of an American AmeriCorps Youth Workforce Development Program provided support services for three abortion clinics in New York City, contrary to federal law. Since this occurred, AmeriCorps has done little to increase confidence in its transparency and integrity. 
We also know that AmeriCorps participants have been caught doctoring hours worked. Program administrators have failed to do background checks on some participants, and there have been data security issues. This record of failures cannot be swept under the rug or dismissed as insignificant. Further, AmeriCorps has not provided complete financial records to independent auditors and the Office of Inspector General since 2017. Congress cannot fulfill its constitutional oversight function without accurate and up-to-date information. In its most recent audit, the independent auditor found nine material weaknesses and one significant deficiency in AmeriCorps' internal control over financial reporting, of which the vast majority were identified in previous audits and remain unaddressed. In fact, following its 2019 audit, only 10 of the 75 recommendations made to AmeriCorps have been implemented. This kind of habitual mismanagement is outrageous, and at some juncture, we need to point the finger at Congress to refusing to fix what is clearly broken. There must be accountability for AmeriCorps' pattern of fraud, mismanagement, noncompliance, and overall inefficient use of taxpayer dollars. Until AmeriCorps makes fixing its financial management a priority, they sh it should not be entrusted with tax dollars from the American people. AmeriCorps is expensive, unnecessary, and has a strong habit of draining taxpayers' wallets. Every year, it presents the American people with fewer and fewer reasons to show it is worth the cost. Our country is known for its robust civil institutions. The U.S. is often ranked as the most generous country in the world when it comes to money donated and time given to charity. Americans don't need federal bureaucrats telling them to do what they already naturally do. We also don't need a federal program to do what the private sector can accomplish at half the price. Despite AmeriCorps' longstanding history of financial failure and mismanagement, House Democrats voted to hand this agency $15 billion more in taxpayer funds through the so-called Build, Build Back Better Act. If AmeriCorps can't handle the responsibility of $1 billion a year, how do we expect it to take care of $15 billion responsible? It's clear Democrats are going to continue to turn a blind eye to the fraud and mismanagement happening right under their noses, and taxpayers will continue to be the ones forced to shoulder the burden. The last time AmeriCorps programs were reauthorized was in 2009 with the passage of the Edward M. Kennedy Serve America Act, which was named in honor of the late senator who was the author of the legislation that governs many of AmeriCorps' programs. Yet despite his support for national service, Senator Kennedy was not shy about his views regarding programs or agencies that failed to meet their intended goals. In debating the establishment of the corporation on the Senate floor in 1993, he noted that, quote, Congress will not and should not fund a program if it is unsuccessful. Three decades later, the results could not be clear. AmeriCorps has proven completely unable or unwilling to govern itself or the programs under its purview. We're reassured every time AmeriCorps representatives come before this committee that they will implement reforms. But AmeriCorps has proven it is all talk and no action. During Senator Kennedy's 1993 floor speech, he stressed that he did not believe AmeriCorps would become unsuccessful but he noted that if he did, if it did, he would favor cutting the program. Quote, I agree with him. This is a failed agency that needs to be overhauled completely or just eliminated. I yield back. Thank you. Without objection, all other members who wish, uh, who wish to insert written statements into the record may do so by submitting them the committee clerk electronically in Microsoft Word format by 5 p.m. on December 15th. I'll now introduce the witnesses. Uh, first, the Honorable Deborah J. Deb Jeffrey was confirmed by the Senate as Inspector General for AmeriCorps in 2012 after 25 years in the private practice of law. She practiced white collar criminal defense and worked on civil enforcement proceedings as well as congressional inspector, inspector general investigations. Mr. Malcolm Coles is the current acting CEO of AmeriCorps 
Most recently, he served as AmeriCorps Executive Advisor to the Chief of Program Operations. He also served as Director of the Director of the Office of Field Liaison, overseeing the administration of AmeriCorps VISTA and senior programs. We, know we appreciate the witnesses for participating today and look forward to your testimony. Let me remind the witnesses that we've read your written statements as, and they will appear in full in the hearing record. Pursuant to committee rule 8D in committee practice, each of you is asked to limit your oral presentation to a five minute summary of your written statement. Before you begin your testimony, please remember to unmute your microphone. During your testimony, staff will be keeping track of time and a light will be will blink when time is up. Please be attentive to time, wrap up, your your, wrap up when your time is over and then remute your microphone. If any of you experience technical difficulties during your testimony, or later in the hearing, you should stay connected to the platform. Make sure you are muted, and use your uh, and use your other phone. Use your phone to immediately call the committee's IT director, whose number was provided to you in advance. Um, we'll let both witnesses make their presentations before we move to member questions. When answering a question, please remember to unmute your microphone. Witnesses are aware of their responsibility to provide accurate information to the committee. And therefore, we will now proceed with their testimony. We'll first recognize Ms. Jeffrey. Chairman Scott, Dr. Fox, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the work of the Office of Inspector General to strengthen financial management and accountability at CNCS, now known as AmeriCorps. My testimony today will focus on the unique challenges that AmeriCorps faces in supporting its mission, particularly with respect to financial management. Many of these difficulties stem from inattention and a legacy of underinvestment in agency operations and technology. A fundamental responsibility of agency management is to track and report on their use of public funds in financial statements subject to independent OIG audit. For the past five years, the financial statements of AmeriCorps and the National Service Trust have not been auditable. The independent auditors have been required to issue disclaimers of opinion because AmeriCorps is unable to demonstrate that its financial statements are accurate, complete, and reliable, and fairly present its financial condition. The auditors have found pervasive weaknesses in AmeriCorps' financial management and financial reporting. An audit report issued two weeks ago listed nine material weaknesses, problems so severe that they could materially affect the financial statements. Five of these weaknesses date back to 2018 and three of them to 2017. In short, AmeriCorps has not shown much progress in resolving serious accountability problems that it has known about for years. The problems go to AmeriCorps' ability to account for its grants and the education awards earned by national service members, which form the agency's largest single liability, recently estimated at $356 million. And there are complicating factors. They include an outdated grants management IT system that does not interface well with the agency's accounting records, among its other issues, difficulties converting AmeriCorps' non-compliant financial records into the form required by the shared services provider to whom AmeriCorps has outsourced its accounting and financial reporting, and an information security program that has stalled for the last three years. In most organizations, a disclaimer of opinion on the financial statements and multiple material weaknesses would have been an all hands on deck emergency requiring immediate action. But AmeriCorps has historically considered financial management to be divorced from the agency's mission and did not treat it as an urgent priority. The current leadership team has assured me that they do not share that view and they have expressed a sense of urgency about improving financial stewardship. They have told me that they will remain engaged to ensure accountability going forward. This new tone at the top is an important first step, but solving these problems is a heavy lift. They did not develop overnight and they will not be cured overnight. 
<laughs> Even in a best case scenario, it will be years before AmeriCorps has robust financial management, plus a new grants management system and effective cybersecurity. Translating urgency into positive change requires the leadership of a strong subject matter expert who can plan and manage a multi-part project over years. Someone who does not have to be told what to do and how to do it. That individual must be empowered to make changes and provided the resources to get the job done. This is the approach that took the Department of Housing and Urban Development from a disclaimer to a clean opinion as described in my written statement and is a, it should serve as an example for AmeriCorps. Strong internal controls, accurate financial reporting and sound financial management are must haves. The OIG looks forward to supporting AmeriCorps work to achieve those objectives. And I would be pleased to answer this committee's questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Coles. Chairman Scott, Ranking Member Fox, and members of this committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the policies and priorities of the Corporation for National and Community Service, also known as AmeriCorps. I'm grateful to have served for the past year as acting CEO of the Federal Agency for Volunteerism and National Service that provides opportunities for Americans to serve their country domestically, address the nation's most pressing challenges, improve lives and communities, and strengthen civic engagement. Each year, the agency invests in local, nonprofit, community, tribal, state organizations, places more than 250,000 AmeriCorps members and AmeriCorps senior volunteers in intensive service in 40,000 communities across the country, and empowers millions more to serve as long-term, short-term, and one-time volunteers. I want to thank the members of the committee and your staff who helped secure additional funding for AmeriCorps as part of the American Rescue Plan. The funding created new service positions for members and volunteers, assisted organizations hardest hit by the pandemic, and increased the living allowance for members, among many other things. We are here because AmeriCorps has received disclaimers of opinion on the agency's financial statement audits since 2017. While the agency has had significant challenges over the years, AmeriCorps continues to take corrective actions, working in close consultation with our Inspector General. Since I began this role, I have seen firsthand our current agency's leadership is committed to achieving greater progress. We are methodically in implementing and updating our plan. We will continue to develop clear milestones and hold our senior management accountable. The path forward is clear. AmeriCorps must strengthen leadership engagement and accountability, must continue to bolster the National Service Trust Fund, must prioritize mission support functions, invest in technology, and improve grant monitoring. We have begun taking strong remedial steps, as our Inspector General noted in her opening statement, and we will continue to act going forward. A few examples include our transition to shared services, hiring for key operational roles, and a robust audit resolution strategy. The cornerstone of our action is to strengthen the agency's financial management is the transition to shared services through the Administrative Resource Center of the Department of Treasury's Bureau of Financial Services, which began in November, 2020. Fiscal year 2021 marked the first full year of agency's shared service agreement. So the agency is now supported by expert technical resources and has improved reporting capabilities. Having the right people in the right seats is paramount to our effort. During 2021, we have hired a chief operating officer, a chief risk officer, a chief of program operations, a director of data management, and other talent to build out our senior management structure. Based on the committee's feedback, AmeriCorps created an office of monitoring in 2019 with staff solely dedicated to performing grant monitoring activities. Fully staffed in 2020, this unit has already operationalized a risk-based approach to monitoring grants of all sizes and continues to tailor its approach so the highest risk grantees are prioritized for monitoring. Our updated risk-based monitoring framework established in July of this year places particular emphasis on compliance, financial, organizational, 
and broad criteria. Developing a robust audit strategy is another linchpin of our strategy going forward. And our senior staff is leadership is pulled together on a robust approach to implement corrective action plans. We are prioritizing resources and staff capacity to address the most important recommendations first. With our current leadership and the support of the administration, Congress, and this committee in particular, AmeriCorps has greatly increased our commitment to operational improvement and enforcing accountability. This is a moment of unprecedented opportunity for AmeriCorps and our nation. President Biden made a bold call to service and unity and Americans are responding. Since the outbreak of COVID-19, AmeriCorps, AmeriCorps members and AmeriCorps senior volunteers have stepped up to the plate to help their neighbors. They have aided more than 12.2 million Americans, including assisting in administering vaccinations, conducting wellness checks, and distributing food. In conclusion, I share your commitment to accountability and good stewardship of the taxpayer dollars. AmeriCorps takes our mission seriously, and we know that we must meet this moment with urgency in order to tackle our country's most pressing issues. Thank you again. We appreciate the responsible oversight of the committee, and I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. Uh, under committee rule 9A, we'll now have questions. We'll now question the witnesses under the five minute rule. I'll be recognizing committee members in seniority order. Um, again, to ensure the members five minute rule is adhered to, staff will be keeping track of time and a blinking light will show when time has expired. Please be attentive. I saw committee members to be attentive time and wrap up your time, wrap up when your time is over and remute your um, microphones. I'll now uh, recognize myself uh, first for five minutes and first ask uh, Ms. Jeffrey. Uh, Ms. Jeffrey, you've indicated that AmeriCorps has had problems with their audits since 2017. And I guess the point of this uh, hearing is to get some confidence that we will not have these problems in the future. Uh, you've indicated several serious and material uh, problems. Can you tell me whether or not AmeriCorps has a uh, correction, uh, corrective action plan for the recommendations that the um, auditors have, um, have made? To the best of my knowledge, AmeriCorps does not yet have a corrective action plan. They've advised us that they are developing one. Um, and we look forward to seeing it to ensure that it will fairly meet the recommendations. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cole. Um, there were the auditors in 2019 made 75 recommendations. 10 have been fulfilled, but since then eight new recommendations have been made. Uh, do you not have a correction, corrective action plan for each of those recommendations? Oh. Mr. Chairman, we are taking under consideration addressing all of the audit recommendations and have closed 10 as been noted before. Uh, we have indeed uh, prioritized those important issues that are centered around uh, the, uh, our national service trust integrity system, our grant uh, accrual system, our internal financial management, and indeed requirements to strengthen our grants monitoring system so that it's truly risk-based and fraud protected. Uh, we have empowered our uh, senior leadership and we expect this to be a whole agency commitment. Uh, we recognize it stops at the starts at the top and we have in, in empowered our risk management council, which is se senior management to take the lead in coming up with corrective action plans. They've already provided a, a template uh, for achievement. Uh, we've conducted training for our staff and we have a, a a, a database to be able to track improvements going forward. We look forward to working on this in conjunction with our inspector general. Well, the reason I asked the question the way I did is the corrective action plans ha have um, discrete plans that can be broken down into a uh, small section so you can get an idea of what you're doing, what progress is being made and quantify that progress. So you can see the progress is being made. Why? Do you intend to have corrective action plans for all of the 73 remaining recommendations? We do, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we definitely do. We plan to capitalize on our successful approach uh, to corrective action planning on our um, 
risk-based monitoring system, uh, which I believe was uh, addressed by the uh, Inspector General earlier. We consider that to be one of our major successes. It's allowed us uh, and GAO, GAO uh, even just last month to, to close successfully five of the recommendations that were uh, stemming from grants uh, management. So, so we can expect corrective action plans on all 70, uh, pretty soon on all 73 of the recommendations that I've yes, said. Yes, you okay. can. Now, uh, in previous bills, we had funding to help get this job done. Is that funding sufficient for staff and equipment that you, that you need to um, get things straight? Quite candidly, Mr. Chairman, we have a dedicated staff that has that works diligently and, and, and has achieved great results. Nevertheless, we still lack capacity. Uh, we were an agency to be zeroed out in the previous administration, and that has serious constraints. I will say that we are very grateful for both regular order appropriations and the funds that have been made available through ARP that are going to allow us to bring on the talent and the capacity necessary to address these, these grave uh, financial issues. Thank you. And Mr. Jeffrey, um, the uh, funding in the uh, ARP, the $1 billion, can you tell me how that has been administered? Is, is that been administered any better than the rest of the funds? So it's very hard for me to answer that question because that money has only recently started to go out the door. We haven't had an opportunity to examine it, and there really isn't a track record to look at. Um, I will say that I think the, the field staff that uh, engages with grantees is overworked and stressed, and I'm concerned about the level of support that our grantees can get. Thank you, my time has expired. Um, on the uh, other side, the first uh, person we recognized, I believe, is a uh, gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Wilson. Thank you very much, Chairman Bobby Scott, and uh, thank you for our witnesses today. Uh, Mr. Coles, the findings uh, so clearly exposed from the Office of Inspector General report are extremely concerning, especially where it notes, quote, little progress as correcting the perversive, pervasive problems, end of quote. While we sit here discussing the corporation's inability to manage taxpayers' dollars, Democrats are irresponsibly forcing a bill that would provide an incredible, unmanageable $15 billion increase to the agency if it were to become law. The Democrats' bill would increase AmeriCorps' budget by a bizarre 1,500%. This uh, is in the midst of uh, fiscal unaccountability. It's in the uh, midst of unintelligible accounting of taxpayers' dollars. Uh, Mr. Coles, um, how in the world, uh, in the beginning of what you have already identified as corrective actions, uh, can the corporations be capable of managing an, an, an additional $15 billion? Let's go to unmute. I got, thank you for your question, Congressman. Uh, I would say that we do have our successes. We have done well in corrective actions around our monitoring systems, we're moving to shared services for greater efficiency there. And our work with criminal history checks uh, has uh, been uh, noted as well as, as a major accomplishment. With regard to the BBB, it is important to note uh, in the House version of the legislation as passed, there is a, a line for over $1 billion to be dedicated to be used by AmeriCorps to address financial management issues, particularly those associated with risk-based monitoring with a heavy emphasis upon fraud protection. So the, the House has recognized the importance of not only providing money for the operation of the CCC itself, but also providing the funding to allow us to accelerate our, our efforts to resolve our management challenges. Well, uh, even that to me is uh, alarming. A billion dollars just for accounting purposes uh, in the district I represent, we have wonderful programs that actually, uh, Chairman Scott, have um, been in place. Uh, but to divert uh, the current budget, almost the entire budget, to uh, to accounting uh, and then bring in another $14 billion, I mean, that, that's just uh, unimaginable. And uh, with that, Ms. Jeffrey, I want to thank you for your clarity and courage 
to expose the fiscal Mr. shortcomings. Mr. Wilson, uh, yeah. will, you, will you yield for just a second? I, I yeah. think you suggested that the billion dollars was for accounting. Uh, you might want to ask if there were services and programs as part of that. Well, actually, uh, Mr. Chairman, his, he said that the there'd be a billion dollars set aside of the 15 billion uh, for uh, the uh, accounting purposes, and th that's what I was trying to address. Because okay, I'd rather pay, hey, Mr. Okay. Chairman, I'd rather go to programs. Not uh, I love accountants, but um, and bookkeepers and bureaucrats, but I'd rather go to um, actually providing services. Please proceed. Thank you. Thank you, and um, Ms. Jeffrey, I, again, I want to thank you for your clarity and courage to expose the fiscal shortcomings. And um, I pose the same question to you. Do you have confidence that the AmeriCorps can manage uh, a phenomenal amount of uh, funding effectively and uh, responsibly? I think it's a major challenge. Um, I can't sit here and tell you that it can't be done, but it won't be easy to do. Now, I want to note one thing that I think is a great advantage, and that is that there is a one year ramp up period in the bill so that the agency actually has a year to spend not only planning for the new the use of the new money, but a year to really invest in trying to get its financial house in order. And, and that is a, a very useful provision that's in the bill. The, it is a risk mitigator, it is not a risk eliminator. And, and thank you for citing that. It is a, a mitigation, but goodness gracious, uh, to me, uh, putting this much money, uh, such an increase, I can't imagine a, a business operating. Uh, I can't, hey, uh, I, I know it would be very difficult for me to take longer than a year if my salary were increased by a factor of 15. Uh, although my wife would help me, uh, it, would, uh, it just couldn't be done. And so, hey, um, I, I express great concern on this. I think it's very irresponsible and uh, I, I appreciate so much uh, Ranking Member Fox, her concerns. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Quijalva. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the hearing. Uh, Ms. Jeffrey, uh, one challenge that AmeriCorps uh, grantees have historically faced was carrying out background checks. Uh, have you seen improvements in the background check process uh, that um, Mr. Coles um, mentioned? In the to the last in, in the last set of questions, and what's what's that mean for grantee management? I am so pleased that you asked that question because it is a pleasure to be able to report on the agency's accomplishments here. Um, it took uh, a great deal of time, but the agency came up with a very smart vendor solution that allows uh, our grantees to outsource the background checks to vendors who can perform them not only competently and privately, but very quickly and accurately. And that has greatly improved compliance with the background check uh, requirements and that improves safety and efficiency throughout the agency. It's not perfect yet, it needs to get better, but it, it, I am very pleased Thank with the trend. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Coles, I, I think you've heard in some of the questioning from my colleagues on the other side of the aisle uh, that, um, that the opposition to, uh, to some extent ARP and to a, great, to a much greater extent uh, Build Back Better uh, le legislation that the House has uh, sent to the Senate, uh, you're at the point of uh, part of that opposition in the sense that there's uh, the 20 billion, 15 billion, whatever that number ends up being after it comes back from the Senate, uh, dedicated to uh, service and dedicated, uh, quite frankly, to uh, uh, to dealing with climate resilience and, and mitigation as, as a key component of that uh, service component. In this one year ramp up uh, that is part of the legislation, will we be ready and accountable uh, at that point? And, uh, and more importantly, outside agents, uh, other agencies that have been working in the field, Conservation Corps, Service Corps, others, uh, any, any plans to link up, co-manage, co-share uh, the responsibility because there will be accountability, not only from Congress, but from the public in terms of uh, the importance of this 
particular line item uh, that is in the Build Back Better plan? Your response. Uh, thank you for your question, Congressman. Uh, yeah, we are laser focused on putting our financial house in order, even if we were not to receive an additional dime. I think the sense of urgency that was triggered by uh, the funding addition of additional billion dollars through ARP even riveted our attention more. And we're keenly aware of the requirements uh, for the PREC, the Pandemic Relief Accountability Committee around fraud awareness. So we have a head start on coming up with successful strategies to in indeed uh, improve our management uh, capacity. Yeah, you know, the part of, part of it also, Mr. Coles, is, is the emphasis that, that the House made and, uh, and the Senate is replicating dealing with issues of equity and undersourced communities and the need to uh, draw a civilian volunteer base uh, from those communities as well. And uh, the same question, are we, is the agency America whose track record has been in other areas primarily and good work? I don't, I don't question that work. Uh, in response to that mandate as well. Yes, Congressman, we do have a strong track record and legacy of successful programs with organizations in the private sector and not-for-profit world that focus upon conservation, that focus upon clean energy, that focus upon disaster preparedness and mitigation, that talk about their efforts and actualize their efforts in community resiliency. So we do feel that that robust history that we have positions as well. This is, this is not a new field for us. Uh, so we feel that we are, with the ramp up time, as I say, well positioned upon enactment to begin the process. Yeah, and, and I think there'll be some of us in Congress in, ter in terms of oversight that will pay particular attention to the equity issue and the resource distribution issue by, by your agency uh, upon uh, the disbursement of those, uh, of that, of that, those resources. We are fully committed, Congressman, to, to diversity and equity, uh, and we're in particularly interested in, in making that broad spectrum so that it includes rural America as well as trad traditional race and ethnicity. Thank you very much. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, next, on my, next on my list is the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Thompson. I don't see him on screen. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate uh, the hearing today and I thank the witnesses for being here and for the committee for holding this hearing. Uh, the findings from the OIG are extremely concerning and perhaps what is more troubling is the apparent lack of resolve within AmeriCorps uh, to uh, resolve its financial management's failures. Ms. Jeffrey, uh, you state in your testimony that in most organizations, and I quote, a disclaimer of opinion and multiple material weaknesses would have been an all hands on deck emergency requiring immediate action. But America, uh, AmeriCorps for many years treated it as a business as usual situation. You go on to state that, that and I quote, the truth is that AmeriCorps leadership simply did not treat fixing financial management as an urgent priority. Ms. Jeffrey, can you discuss what it means when an agency such as AmeriCorps issues a disclaimer of opinion? So it, it is very rarely done in the civilian agencies of government. Um, HUD went through a period of a disclaimer they were able to get their act together and fix their financial management over the course of four years. They went from a disclaimer to a clean opinion. And they did it by um, getting outside subject matter leadership who had the temperament and the skill set to manage a large project with support from the administration uh, and with empowerment um, from the head of the agency to just get it done. Um, there is one other agency that I'm aware of in the federal government that's had repeated disclaimers, one other civilian agency, it's the Railroad Retirement Board. I am less familiar with where they are, but I think they're still in a disclaimer. Um, this ought to be regarded as urgent. It is, um, it, it is really scandalous that the agency has not 
made better use of its time to remedy these problems. Um, and the agency wasted an awful lot of time in this process. Uh, it was under prior leadership, um, but I am, I, I, there is a need to get down to work yesterday. So, so I guess to uh, review what you said, it is significant for an agency or department to issue a disclaimer opinion on its audit and that it happens relatively in relatively few cases across federal government. Uh, and AmeriCorps stands out uh, in, in a negative light with this. I agree completely. Okay. Uh, Mr. Coles, uh, AmeriCorps uh, operates several programs that currently receive in total nearly $1 billion in annual appropriations. Now, uh, having said that, I know that this doesn't sound like a lot in today's Congress. We're talking about trillions as if they were thousands of dollars. But I know this, uh, this is a problem in, in the real world and that it's a significant amount of money. How does the corporation examine the success or failure of each of its programs? Uh, we have, thanks first for your, for your question, Congressman. Uh, we have a, a robust uh, review process on applicants upon their submission. So that we have great rigor in the system to ensure that they have the, the organizational capacity and provide no risk. As well, we have a, uh, as I mentioned, a newly stood up monitoring of office uh, which has developed a risk-based monitoring framework with heavy emphasis in particular upon organizational readiness and anti-fraud awareness. Uh, it's robust does, and I think that you've noticed that the, Congress, that the uh, Inspector General in our statement made mention of that. that. Does it involve evaluating their effectiveness, the effectiveness of the program? Um, and if so, who does it? Um, how is it validated? And what review cycles is, is it in? So each, each year, our Office of Monitoring uh, selects high-risk uh, grantees uh, based upon their algorithm and our previous experience and knowledge in their operations. And we prioritize them for a deep dive in terms of their capacity to deliver, fulfillment of their objectives, uh, financial uh, stability. And we do it based upon the risk-based criteria that I mentioned. Well, then, then let me ask Ms. Jeffrey, uh, should taxpayers have confidence that the funds are being used for the intended purpose and that these programs are effectively evaluated? So I think you've asked two different questions there. One of them is uh, how organizations use the funds. And I do not believe our mon the agency's monitoring program is effective at doing that. The other question goes to performance measures. What do we expect grantees to accomplish? And how do we know they're accomplishing that? The agency does have performance measures, but they are um, they tend to be about outputs, not outcomes. Some of that is because it is difficult to measure outcomes in social intervention. So it's not easy to have other performance measures. Uh, but I, I would like at some point at least to be able to share my view of monitoring because um, it is not quite as positive, I think, as uh, Mr. Coles has suggested. The gentleman's time has expired. I'll back. Thank you. Um, Gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Courtney. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing, which I think demonstrates the seriousness with which our committee um, takes the issues that we're talking about here today. Ms. Jeffrey, I want to point, just follow up on one um, uh, moment that you testified. Uh, again, you were pretty clear to say that you're, you know, in terms of other examples, and you talked about HUD, which I think is very helpful for all of us to know that you know agencies can correct problems. Um, but you, you refer to civilian agencies. Um, and I just you know, want to be clear, you obviously are, are not including the Department of Defense in terms of your description of that. And I, and I saw, see you nodding your head. If you could just for the record say that um, that's correct. That's exactly right. Yes. And I say that because as a member of the House Armed Services Committee with my friend from South Carolina and Mr. Norcross, uh, in fact, the Department of Defense um, for decades was not auditable. And I know that because I sat on the subcommittee on auditability with uh, former Congressman uh, Mike Conaway from Texas, who was an auditor. 
Um, and with the push from Congress, uh, we actually now have started to finally get to the point where the Department of the Navy and Army and the Air Force are finally submitting audits. Again, a lot of them are still not full, um, you know, uh, clean audits, but um, it, it's been a monumental effort. Um, and, uh, but no one during that whole decades long process suggested that we should shut down the Department of Defense. Um, you know, we, we, we obviously need to have a, a military, but, um, you know, I, I offer that example just because, you know, clearly, you know, you, you've done great work identifying problems. I think Mr. Cole shows a sincere effort to, and, and de desire to implement those. And obviously Congress, just as we did on the House Armed Services Committee, needs to help push that effort so that we get to the point, but we don't shut down uh, AmeriCorps in the meantime. And I, I would just note that, you know, grantees who are the backbones of this program, um, in my district, uh, which is a military district, we have a AmeriCorps program run by senior volunteers, Veterans Coffee House, which uh, again has been a smashing success to use uh, Senator Kennedy's uh, quote that was uh, alluded to earlier here uh, in terms of connecting veterans, particularly older veterans, uh, through a really fun social setting to learn about ways that they can get help from the VA during COVID. Uh, again, the vaccination rate from the Connecticut uh, VA healthcare system was number two or three in the country in terms of vaccinating uh, veterans. And again, the Coffee House uh, AmeriCorps program was instrumental in terms of uh, making sure that uh, people, uh, again, got access to, to vaccinations um, in a more rural part of the state of Connecticut. So Mr. Coles, I mean, again, I, I wanna talk about, you know, how, you know, you plan to strengthen that grantee end of the system, which at the end of the day is where the, you know, the real work of AmeriCorps happens. And, um, you know, th they obviously are part of this auditing problem. And maybe you could just talk about that for a moment. Uh, thank you very much for your, for your, for your questions, Congressman. I'd be, I'd be pleased to, to do so. Uh, we do recognize uh, that we have high performing grantees at the, at the local level. We, we salute them all. But we are also mindful that we need to take an initiative to put them in a better position for success. And then in conjunction with our inspector general, uh, we are launching a, a, a web-based training program for every grantee across our entire pro program portfolio uh, that will uh, provide them with information with respect to the requirements for good stewardship of the taxpayer dollar. Uh, as well in our applications, uh, we are very clear in our criteria that we're looking for organizations that have track records of integrity and reliability. Uh, and we're very committed uh, to providing training and technical assistance beyond fraud awareness to improve, improve program quality of all of our programs. And in her opening comments, you know, Ms. Jeffrey referred to the sort of legacy of underinvestment in terms of the agency's, um, you know, technology and, um, you know, systems. I mean, I guess, you know, if you could just talk about that, I mean, in terms of how that has been an obstacle for the agency, Mr. Coles. Thank you. Yes. Uh, over the past prior four years, uh, we were in a resource challenged environment. We were an agency that was targeted to be zeroed out by the previous administration. And we were really under-resourced when it came to addressing our most critical challenges and problems. And we, we lost more than 100 staff. We were reduced from 600 to 500 staff simply because we didn't have the financial resourcing. We also lost out on opportunities to improve our technology modernization. We uh, were interested in applying for a grant from OMB's uh, the Technical Modernization Fund, uh, but we were not allowed to because we were on the close-up list. So it has been a, a real constraint. Uh, again, our core group is dedicated and capable, but we need much more capacity, both internally and externally. We need the collaboration with our partners, including the Office of Management, Budget, GAO, this committee, and the Inspector General. And consistency. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. The um, gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Grothman. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Jeffrey, I'm going to ask you a few more questions. Uh, it's kind of shocking what I've heard today. I, I guess uh, AmeriCorps, to a certain extent, flew under the radar. And I, I am a little bit worried 
that if any uh, volunteers put AmeriCorps on their resume, it's going to put them in their desire for other jobs at a disadvantage compared to other job applicants who worked for a more tightly run organization. I'm a little bit worried that we're going to forever damage people who work there. But I'd like to look at some of the examples of fraud. Uh, there have been settlements with regard to the University of North Carolina, East Carolina University, and the North Carolina Commission on Volunteerism and Community Service for false claims. Are you familiar with this case? Indeed familiar with those cases. Uh, since 2019, we have, uh, my office has recovered $4.8 million in fraud, civil fraud settlements plus uh, a criminal restitution order of more than half a million dollars. Oh my goodness. Uh, according to the Department of Justice, these entities approve false certificates for service hours, worked and related violations. Uh, there seems to be complete lack of pro proper oversight. Uh, can you give me a little more specific on, on your comments? Certainly. So um, in, for the AmeriCorps state national programs, members must serve a minimum number of hours in order to qualify for an education award. And we have found that at certain grantees, there has been systematic fraud to allow people to receive education awards who were not really eligible to receive them. Oh my goodness. There are so many employers in my district who would be so grateful to find a few people to work and they would be real jobs in which they learned real skills. And uh, it's unfortunate that some people wound up working for this organization that seems to me so totally damaged in its reputation. But the next instance I'd like to talk about is there's a case involving embezzlement and bribes in Hawaii. You wanna educate the uh, committee a little bit on that? So that is one of the most disturbing cases that I've ever seen because it involved um, uh, essentially a conspiracy between the executive director of the Hawaii Commission, which is one of the major prime grantees, and um, a program administrator at a subrecipient. And these two people were endlessly inventive about ways to siphon money away from the people of Hawaii who needed these programs and into their own pockets. We were fortunate that when we brought the case, we were able to interrupt and prevent um, a further bilking of CARES Act funds uh, uh, for the state of Hawaii. Oh my goodness. I assume other people in the organization must have noticed this fraud. Are, are you afraid that the people who committed the fraud may be permanently educated the young people who are volunteering for AmeriCorps on some kind of uh, immoral or sloppy behavior? I don't hear her. Ms. Jeffries, you're on mute. So sorry, in Hawaii, the misconduct was really confined to paid staff. It did not involve members, um, but there were other jurisdictions in which sadly, uh, uh, AmeriCorps members were being encouraged to commit fraud in a program that's supposed to foster civic engagement. And that is truly awful. I read here about some bad things going on in East St. Louis as well. Are you familiar with that? Yes. Uh, you want to educate the committee a little bit what was going on in East St. Louis? So that one also involved the false certification of education awards. That is the member and the organization asserting that they had served service hours they had not in fact served. Oh my goodness, and there's so many employers in my district who would be so grateful to take young people and give them a good work ethic and educate them on some skills that would help them throughout their life. It's unfortunately some of these people got caught up in the net of AmeriCorps, but thank you for showing up today. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Wilson. Uh, 
Thank you so much, Chairman Scott and Ranking Member Fox for holding today's hearing. And thank you to our witnesses for appearing before our committee. I am so grateful uh, and proud of the impact AmeriCorps has made not only to my district, but across the country. AmeriCorps volunteers serve on the front lines of many of our nation's pressing challenges and enrich their communities, including by helping students graduate high school and enroll in college, building and rehabilitating portable housing, providing financial literacy training, and responding to natural disasters. In the past year and a half, AmeriCorps members and volunteers have made integral to COVID-19 response efforts, helping Americans access vaccines and distributing emergency food aid. In the past year alone, more than 600 AmeriCorps members and volunteers have served in my congressional district across 29 different projects. And since 1994, more than 4,000 of my constituents have served approximately 6 million hours. We must preserve and strengthen this program for the next generation of members and volunteers so they may benefit from the unique opportunities for civic engagement that AmeriCorps provides so that we can all benefit from their service. But to do so, we must ensure that AmeriCorps has the tools needed to prevent fraud and abuse and carry out a rigorous management and oversight strategy. We are here today to monitor AmeriCorps' progress and ensure that the necessary steps are being taken so that this historic program can fulfill the promise with which it was founded nearly 30 years ago. With this in mind, I have a few questions for our witnesses. Mr. Coles, grantees are the backbone of the success of AmeriCorps. What steps have the agency taken to require grantees to better comply with the single audit process and what work has the agency done to improve its grant monitoring uh, processes? Thank you for your, your questions, uh, Congresswoman. Uh, let me start with the latter, if I may. Uh, as referenced, we have created a specific unit dedicated to risk-based monitoring of all of our investments in, into local programs. Uh, and we're very clear in sharing with our grantees exactly what that system looks like in terms of transparency, so that they're aware of essentially the rules of the road. Uh, we follow that up with uh, regular trainings. We used to do more in person, we now do them virtually, uh, to make sure that grantees are fully aware of both their responsibilities and the requirements for compliance. Uh, we, we, take that, we take that responsibility very, very seriously. Uh, the second question we had with regard to the Single Audit Act, uh, that is part of the review process of our Office of Monitoring. Uh, in many agencies that we find don't rise to the level of the Single Audit Act requirement because they're under a limit of 750,000, but those that do, uh, we are very focused on ensuring that we, that we take a good hard look at it and to make sure that uh, it, it is indeed uh, supportive of their good standing. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Mr. Jeffrey, in your testimony, you described that CNCS has made progress to update uh, their grant risk. Uh, could you please discuss these updates and why these actions were important for the successful issuance of grants and grant management? I'd be delighted to. <clears throat> for a very long time, AmeriCorps used a sort of one size fits all approach to grant risk. And we demonstrated through a study that that approach was not effective. And then GAO came in and said also that that approach was not effective. We worked very closely with the office of the chief, chief risk officer to create a data-driven grant risk model. And in fact, we made some, some data sources available to the agency to feed into this model. I think that has been a notable achievement. It is still very new in its enactment and it will definitely need refinement. 
but this was a very thoughtfully done effort and was quite an accomplishment. I do think, however, that there are um, significant issues in how the agency monitors grants um, and, and large changes that need to be made there. Thank you so much. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Thompson. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate this opportunity. Uh, I'd like to thank both witnesses for being here today and giving us the opportunity to understand the problems facing AmeriCorps, or most formally known as the Corporation for National and Community Service. As we all know, AmeriCorps coordinates and administers eight different federal programs and initiatives aimed to educate students for the 21st century jobs, support neighborhoods on the road to economic recovery, address the needs of military families, help communities rebuild after a natural disaster, promote health and well-being, and preserve the nation's parks and public lands. AmeriCorps is entrusted with over $1 billion of taxpayer funds every year, but AmeriCorps cannot carry out its mission if it's not run efficiently. And while I've been a huge supporter of AmeriCorps' mission, I have some concerns after reading the Inspector General's audit report. Uh, Ms. Jeffrey, the audit report found that AmeriCorps had poor communications and lacked responsiveness to auditors regarding information that should be readily available to the corporation. In addition, the audit noted that it took months to in some cases to get a response. Can you describe this issue in more detail? What types of documents is the, is the audit referring to? These were really basic audit documents and basic financial data. So for example, the auditors need to be able to take a sample of transactions to review as part of their work. They were not able um, on time to get a population that was complete and correct from which they could select a sample. That's the kind of thing. They're told documents exist, the documents are not produced or what's produced is partial, clearly missing things, um, or they get information, data about grants that is internally inconsistent so they know that, that it, it's not correct and it hasn't undergone a quality review. Let me say here, I don't think this was any sort of deliberate effort to withhold um, information from the auditors. I think it was a level of dysfunction and disorganization and a lack of sufficient people and properly trained people to be able to pull the necessary information. Uh, thank you, Ms. Jeffrey. Uh, Mr. Coles, I know AmeriCorps continue to face difficulties when complying with the law, in particular the Improper Payments Elimination and Recovery Act. And while AmeriCorps has reduced improper payments as a result uh, of using vendors to conduct criminal background checks for grantee employees, the high level of improper payments coupled with those payments remain a concern and draws into question the corporation's ability to assure taxpayers their funds are spent in accordance with the law. Uh, what would you say your main challenge is when it comes to assessing and reporting improper payments? Thank you for your question, uh, Congressman, and, and uh, thanks uh, very much to the Inspector General for uh, her assistance in assisting us in approving our, our risk management uh, profile system. Uh, improper payments are a major concern of ours. As we discussed earlier, uh, successful systems we've put in place with respect to criminal history checks to protect vulnerable populations uh, have been, I think, a major accomplishment for it. But there are other improper payments that we remain doggedly pursuing in terms of minimizing exposure. And around the issues of, of timesheets, uh, or be it segregation of funds, uh, regardless of the size of those, they all show up as improper payments. Uh, and we are committed through this risk-based monitoring system to educating and raising the consciousness of our grantees to ensure that they have the proper knowledge and the skills available to them to be able to comply with those requirements and minimize improper payments. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, in, in your opinion, why has it taken the corporation so much time to work towards a system of accurate reporting? I think the inspector general touched upon the, the, the core issue. I think it wasn't a lack of desire, it wasn't intentional, we simply don't have the bandwidth and the capacity and have not had it for years. Uh, we have a dedicated core group, but it's insufficient to meet 
has been insufficient to meet our all core requirements, which is why we're doubling down so significantly right now on prioritizing mission support functions, uh, especially around audit resolution. Very good. Uh, thank you both. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, thank you. Uh, the gentlelady from Oregon, Ms. Bonamici. Thank you, uh, Chairman Scott, and thank you to our witnesses. You know, last year, more than 3,000 Oregonians participated in AmeriCorps-funded programs across more than 500 service locations, and members and volunteers helped respond to Oregon's increasingly catastrophic annual wildfires. In education, they developed music programs for rural communities, helped improve healthy food curricula. These are beneficial service opportunities, but I recognize that AmeriCorps must act with intention to strengthen internal controls, rebuild the agency's workforce, and protect against fraud. Mr. Coles, in the funding included in the House Pass Build Back Better Act, $6.9 billion is provided for projects related to climate resilience and mitigation, important work. The legislation directs AmeriCorps to provide participants with workforce development opportunities such as pre-apprenticeships and pathways to post-service employment in high quality jobs, including registered apprenticeships. So Mr. Coles, AmeriCorps uh, of course needs to overcome current internal operational barriers and scale up to get this funding out the door. Uh, with these challenges, as well as AmeriCorps' primary focus on providing members and volunteers with short-term service opportunities, how will AmeriCorps work to expand its reach to meet the workforce requirements in the Build Back Better Act? Uh, thank you for your question, Congresswoman. Uh, you're right, the provisions in the uh, Build Back Better with respect to the Civilian Climate Corps are unique. Uh, there is an intentional connection between the value of the service provided by the AmeriCorps members during the time that they're with, with the Civilian uh, uh, Climate Corps. Uh, with a pipeline effect that will prepare them for job readiness going forward. And I think we take that very, very seriously. I think it's a commitment that we wanna to continue to make to our members uh, that national service is not only a great contribution to their communities, but it's also a good investment in their future. So we're committed to, to uh, totally being supportive of, of that dynamic. Do you have particular plans though to actually uh, meet those workforce requirements? Uh, that will be part of our plan. Fortunately, as was mentioned before, if the if, when the bill is enacted, uh, there's a 180-day uh, report requirement in terms of initial action. And then there is the one-year ramp-up period that we have to actually flesh out the contours of those specific requirements. Th thank you. And Mr. Coles, we know that AmeriCorps' salary and expenses funding has decreased or stayed flat since 2010. And at the same time, AmeriCorps has taken on new support roles and responsibilities, including the new security and reporting requirements mandated by Congress. And the budget for agency operations has been cut, uh, and AmeriCorps has had to absorb the cost of inflation. So I'm going to ask a few questions about that. How will the additional investments provided by Build Back Better and the agency's personnel and infrastructure help AmeriCorps meet its fiduciary, financial, and operational requirements, identify and mitigate risk, provide effective program support, and also ensure mission success? Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. The, clearly, the resourcing provided by the American Rescue Plan uh, is, is a, is a is a great asset for us right now. It allows us to immediately go forward and to uh, bring on resources to uh, fill those critical gaps that we have, both in terms of the skill areas and the, in the, the sort of magnitude of the skill areas. Financial management is very high on our list. Uh, the idea of data analysis uh, skill sets that we can bring on so that we can make informed decisions on our investments. Uh, the idea of being able to attract project management talent, particularly that can manage IT modernization, uh, which is a foundational piece of what we're doing, uh, and also continuing our investments in the risk-based monitoring to ensure program integrity and that the taxpayer gets the maximum return. Those are, those are our areas. Thank you. And, and could you just comment on how the annually appropriated budget for AmeriCorps compares uh, to other pre-Build Back Better to other small agencies with similar responsibilities? Uh, regrettably, I cannot. I, and I wouldn't want to wander into that thicket. Uh, I, I can check that out and I'd be glad to respond back to you in the committee. 
I, I appreciate that. And, and I just wanted to hone in just a little bit on your last answer. Do you have enough staff? Will you have enough staff to achieve your oversight and accountability goals? And if not, what steps are you taking to staff up quickly so that you can meet those requirements? So as I mentioned, the assets provided by ARP are, are fundamental uh, to our ability to staff up, gear up, and also bring on external capacity and skill sets that we don't have and to further train our own staff. But it is a short-term solution. The funding evaporates at the end of FY24. So we need to work with the administration, with OMB, with Congress to come up with a more sustainable funding strategy to ensure that we don't find ourselves in a slipping back uh, situation going forward. Th thank you, Mr. Coles. My time has expired. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, the next is Ms. Stefanik. I don't see on the screen. Then Mr. Allen, gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me okay? <clears throat> I want yes. to thank you. Thank you, sir. I want to thank you for uh, holding this hearing, and I want to thank our witnesses for uh, trying to explain uh, what to, what is going on here and the reason for the concern. Obviously, uh, dealing with public funds is a high calling, and uh, public trust is uh, is critical. Uh, you know, as far as the uh, citizenry is concerned today, that's probably where I get most of the questions uh, about how we're dealing with, uh, with the, the, the money they sacrificed and earned to uh, support this government. Uh, Ms. Jeffrey, the audit report found that AmeriCorps had poor communication and lacked responsiveness to auditors, auditors regarding information that should be readily available to the corporation. In fact, the audit noted that it took months in some cases to get a response. Can you describe this issue in a little more detail and what types of documents uh, is the audit referring to? Sure, so let me, let me say this. Responsiveness has been a challenge at the agency for many, many years. Um, I don't believe this was willful in terms of withholding information. I think it is, in some respects, a feature of the fact that the agency's financial systems are, don't lend themselves to providing auditable information. Um, and I think some of it is just a lack of organization and a lack of uh, an inability to track the requests. Uh, Mr. Coles, uh, what have you done as acting CEO to address these uh, these problems that uh, this lack of responsiveness. I mean, this is uh, uh, this is unconscionable. I mean, uh, these people are dealing with public funds. Uh, they should understand the responsibility of that. Can you tell me what you're doing? I mean, frankly, uh, you should be defunded until you correct these things. Uh, I mean, you know, this thing's gone on, like I said, for five years. Can you tell me what you're trying to do to, to, to fix this? Uh, thank you for your question, Congressman. Uh, I would first uh, refer to the Inspector General's comment about dysfunction and a lack of, not being a lack of intent, not being intentional. Uh, and it's a capacity issue and we're keenly aware of it. But more importantly, we need to adopt and have adopted an, an agency-wide accountability model. And that starts at the top. That starts with folks like me, and senior managers, taking the responsibility and ensuring that others understand that it is their responsibility as well. We did, and this is specific, uh, create a, a new internal audit accountability and reporting structure. And that was a derivative of the work that we did to strengthen our monitoring. And that is going to be the epicenter of our corrective action okay. planning process. All right, yeah, and if you would furnish the committee with a full report of what actions you're taking, that would be helpful. Ms. Jeffrey, the financial audit report also notes that a key reason for AmeriCorps' lack of progress with respect to fixing its numerous problems is due to a lack of engagement and accountability by senior leadership. Can you elaborate on what you mean, lack of engagement and accountability? Well, I will say this. Um, for about two years, the agency uh, gave responsibility to fix these audit issues to two senior uh, individuals, neither of whom was trained as an accountant. 
And not surprisingly, they wasted a lot of time on unproductive efforts. Uh, I talked to the CEO and her senior leadership team about that problem repeatedly during the process and uh, nothing changed. They seemed, they conveyed to me, they felt helpless to do anything about it. Um, I think the level of engagement we're hearing about now from Mal Coles is quite different. I think there's a, a much greater level of activism and um, involvement. And I think that <coughs> tone at the top is really important yeah. and all so to I, the good, but it's I, just- I, a I hope step. so, I'm just about out of time. You know, as my colleagues have mentioned, I'm very concerned with this issue at hand today. Government programs must be accountable to the taxpayers. Repeated instances of non-compliance are just not acceptable. And to make matters worse, it's mentioned that Build Back Better would increase funding for AmeriCorps. These are hundreds of worthy nonprofits. And there are hundreds of worthy nonprofits in my home state of Georgia and across the country meeting the needs of America without the burden of this government bureaucracy. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, thank you. The gentleman from California, Mr. Takano. Well, thank you, Chairman Scott, for holding this hearing. Uh, and I believe it's of, of paramount importance that we ensure that inspector generals can do their jobs without reprisal or retribution. I certainly want to uh, 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 thank uh, Deborah Jeffrey for her uh, work. Uh, and, um, uh, and I'm proud of the, uh, that the committees under the House Democratic leadership have prioritized the issue of allowing inspector generals to conduct their work independently. And I'm a proud co-sponsor of Representative Schiff's Protecting Our Democracy Act, which contains a sweeping set of reforms aimed at strengthening our democracy. And one of the critical reforms within this legislation calls for cause of removal of inspector generals to bolster the integrity of, our, of, of, of the system. And I hope members on both sides of the aisle in this particular instance really understand the critical role of inspector generals in congressional oversight and us and, that, and for the people to have confidence that we have a system of government that will hold uh, government officials accountable and will ensure that programs work effectively. Um, protecting the independence of the inspector generals will increase, uh, will strengthen accountability and transparency of our democratic institutions. My colleague, Carolyn, Representative Carol Maloney also has an effort uh, entitled the IG Independence and Empowerment Act which specifically addresses issues regarding IGs and the Council of Inspector Generals on Integrity and Efficiency uh, and Efficiency uh, Integrity Committee. The bill allows an IG to be removed only for cause, such as for documented malfeasance. I would encourage all members of this committee to support both of these efforts. And I'm gonna tell you, as chairman of the House Veterans of Harris Committee, I have personally experienced a cabinet official attempting to remove an Inspector General. It was deeply troubling to witness such an attempt and cabinet officials should not have unilateral authority to remove IDs without cause and no should a president be able to do this. Uh, it's very important that Congress get the straight skinny on what's going on with the agencies. With that being said, Ms. Jeffries, Ms. Jeffrey, the external auditors findings show that there are several areas in which both the AmeriCorps and National Service Trusts can improve their financial management and internal controls program. Can you please inform the committee about which findings and recommendations that you would prioritize? So one feature of IG, <clears throat> excuse me, independence is that we need to be very careful not to design the corrective action plan ourselves um, in order to maintain independence under the audit rules. But I can say this, if you do a sensitivity analysis and you say which changes will make the greatest difference to the agency, it is plainly the issues that relate to grants and relate specifically to the National Service Trust. Um, I would then put in the hopper the general um, finding about uh, financial reporting. I, I think until those three matters are fixed, it will be very difficult for the agency to move forward in a major way. Uh, thank you. Are there any recommendations that in your opinion are easier to implement and should be done within the next three to six months? 
Well, there's one that comes to mind and I would, I would identify it like this. Um, there was a problem last year that did not appear in this year's audit that dealt with how certain property is accounted for. It's really important to get on top of that because the agency is about to undertake some new capital projects for IT, for example. And if the agency doesn't fix its process now, they're gonna end up with that as a material weakness in the future. And I think it's really important to prevent that. Uh, well, thank you. And which of the recommendations do you believe will have the greatest overall impact if addressed? It's clearly the ones that relate to the National Service Trust and relate to the specific uh, uh, grant matters. Um, Ms. Jeffrey, what do you believe is a reasonable and necessary timeline for AmeriCorps uh, team to implement the most impactful recommendations? So to some degree, that's a function of what resources the agency can bring to bear on this. And it's a function of the quality of the leadership. Um, I think with a very strong leader, they could make tremendous progress in a two to three year period. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, uh, I thank uh, Ms. Jeffrey for her work. I thank you for your work. Uh, and I, I hope that all my colleagues will join me in focusing attention on how to strengthen uh, the independence of our uh, inspector generals uh, and pass legislation uh, that will say that only they can be removed for cause. Uh, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Banks, I don't see the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Comer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Cole, as a ranking member of the House Committee on Oversight, I find the results from the Office of Inspector General extremely concerning. Right now, Democrats are negotiating a proposed $15 billion increase to the corporation for national community service. Yes, the same programs that failed an audit requiring this hearing here today are the same programs for which Democrats are proposing a 1,500% increase. So Mr. Cole, given the circumstances of your testimony before this committee today, do you believe that the corporation can manage an additional $15 billion given their continual failures and lack of accountability? Uh, thank you for your question, Congressman. Uh, actually, I believe that over the past 18 months, we've made significant progress. We've gained traction. I've already cited a number of the corrective measures that we've taken and we're well positioned uh, with our new uh, audit accountability and reporting structure, corrective action plans to indeed uh, address even more of these outstanding audit recommendations. So I feel that we have momentum behind us. I would also say that the timetable provided, uh, the resources provided through ARP and the timetable provided by the BBB uh, would allow us to ramp up accordingly and develop the management capacity essential to be good stewards of the taxpayers' money. But Ms. Jeffrey, I'll pose the same question to you. Do you have confidence in AmeriCorps' ability to manage this substantial amount of funding responsibility? I think it will be very challenging and a very heavy lift. Um, AmeriCorps has known about some of these problems, including uh, this year, that they hadn't made progress on some of these areas since April or May. Um, in my view, they should have been developing corrective action plans for at least some of those matters so that those corrective action plans would be completed and would be um, in the midst of being executed by now. So that gives me some pause. So, Ms. Jeffrey, is it possible to verify these funds achieve the goals set out when these programs were established without any imminent changes to the oversight and reporting of program administration? We generally have not, the, the Office of Inspector General has not typically looked at overall program performance. We've focused much more on program integrity and financial management. Um, our office is too small to be able to do the performance reviews. I guess this is my time to make a plug for uh, more appropriations for my office and to develop that capacity. Well, 
I'm still having difficulty seeing how the waste that's so entrenched in these programs will ever be able to be rooted out short of reforming or better yet, eliminating the programs entirely. To that point, Ms. Jeffrey, I have a few questions based on a press release from the Department of Justice about a case in my home state of Kentucky. Mm -hmm. uh, are you familiar with the Partner Corps STEM AmeriCorps program? I am indeed, and I'm, I'm familiar with the, uh, the right. matter that you're speaking of. Okay, so as you know, during the 2017-2018 school year, an AmeriCorps member submitted six timesheets falsely reporting that she had performed her duties. Is that correct? That's correct. So during that time, what was she paid? And did she do any of the work that she had claimed? During that time, she did none of the work. She stopped showing up entirely, just kept submitting timesheets. And for some reason, her supervisor kept signing them, uh, not understanding that she wasn't showing up, which definitely raises questions about the quality and level of supervision. The amount in question, I checked this the other day, it was about, uh, it was less than $3,000. Uh, but it's more the fact that, that this shows such a weakness in the oversight at that program. So how was this fraud caught and how prevalent is timesheet fraud in this program, do you think? I can't recall how this particular one came to light. I think it may have been that the organization detected it, uh, but too late. Um, and they, that's it, they stopped payment before the last payment could be made because they noticed she wasn't showing up and they reported it to us. In terms of timesheet fraud, um, it's very difficult for me to say what the extent of it is. What I can tell you is that it's all too easy and the agency needs to do a better job not only of educating uh, grantees about fraud awareness, but helping our grantees develop strong internal controls to prevent this from happening. Well, thank you, Ms. Jeffries, and my time has expired, so uh, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. The gentlelady from North Carolina, Ms. Adams. Thank you, uh, Chair Scott, for holding uh, this hearing, and thank you to the witness uh, for testifying about uh, funding uh, such an important program. Uh, as we continue to look ahead and focus on making substantive investments in our communities, we hope that individuals will have an interest in, in serving their own communities through AmeriCorps. Uh, I would like to just take a moment uh, here to highlight the numbers from my district, the 12th District of North Carolina. Since 1994, more than 2,300 District 12 residents have served approximately 4.29 million hours through AmeriCorps. Uh, earning uh, Siegel AmeriCorps Corps Education Awards totaling close to $12 million. That's pretty commendable. Uh, I look forward to, to seeing the continued positive impact of AmeriCorps as, as time goes on. Uh, Inspector General Jeffrey, uh, the House recently passed the Build Back Better Act, which allocated over $1 billion to AmeriCorps for administrative expenses or close to 9% of its total outlays uh, in BBB. The bill also included robust language requiring an evaluation of CNCS's information technology, security, corrective actions to address recommendations arising from audits of the agency and the National Service Trust. And in consultation with the Inspector General, the development of grant fraud prevention and detection controls and risk-based anti-fraud grant monitoring. So how important will this increase in administrative funds and legislative requirements be in improving the effective management of AmeriCorps? I think it will be critical. And I think it's not simply the resources, but the clear sense of Congress that these need to be priorities for the agency. That messaging is absolutely critical. Um, and I wanna thank the, the Congress for uh, inserting those requirements. I, I'd like to say, two other things. One is that it is precisely because these programs are important that I think it's essential that they be on a sound financial footing. I wouldn't be pouring my heart and soul into this 
um, if I didn't care about these programs. And the other thing I would say relative to the fraud issue is fraud is an issue in every grant program in the federal government. The risk and the problem is not unique to AmeriCorps. Um, it is just that AmeriCorps really needs to ramp up its efforts to prevent and detect fraud. So I Thank don't you. want to leave a misimpression about that. Thank you very much. Uh, acting uh, CEO Coles, how important, how does uh, AmeriCorps anticipate drawing attention to its positive impact in communities across America? Uh, thank you for your question, uh, Congresswoman. Uh, we're, we're enormously proud of the contributions that Americans make through national service, uh, the impacts that they have in solving community problems. And we, we always seek every opportunity to shine a spotlight on those remarkable stories and contributions. So we're, we're very much committed to amplifying our successes uh, as much as we are committed to addressing our shortcomings. So we're, Thank we're you. very committed to that. Thank you. Inspector General of Jeffrey, um, one challenge AmeriCorps guarantees have historically faced was carrying out criminal history or background checks. So have you seen improvements in the background check process and what has that meant for grantee management? I think that has improved tremendously because the agency has developed a program by which grantees can outsource those checks to uh, vendors that are able to do them with great precision and very quickly. And I think it's a great idea to take this difficult task off the shoulders of grantees and hand it over to experts so our grantees can focus on operating their programs. Great. Uh, how does the... Um... The leadership of, this is to um, uh, CEO Coles, how does the leadership of AmeriCorps anticipate the trage trajectory of its outreach so that more diverse individuals can be recruited and participate in the service that uh, uh, AmeriCorps undertakes? Uh, the Biden administration is committed fully to providing equal opportunity and access to all Americans. And we take that charge very, very seriously. Uh, we are committed uh, to having outreach programs that engage organizations in particularly high poverty areas that have not historically been able to access our resources. That's a prioritization for us currently. Uh, and in the, in the Build Back Better bill as well, there's an additional provision for further outreach for both individuals who've historically not participated along with organizations from communities that have not participated. Thank you, sir. I'm out of time, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure who's next. Let me just call the names I have. Mr. Banks, Mr. Fulcher, Mr. Keller, Dr. Murphy, Ms. Miller-Meeks, Mr. Owen, Mr. Good, Ms. McLean, Ms. Harshbarger, Ms. Miller, Ms. Sparks, Ms. Fitzgerald, Ms. Cawthorn, Ms. Steele, Mrs. Letlow, you recognize for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I see Mr. Keller on the screen. Well, I'm sorry, well, he didn't say anything. I wasn't sure I was supposed to. I was just waiting for somebody to let me know when my turn was. Okay. Um, um, you, want to be, you want to be called now? I'm fine, yes. Okay, the, um, excuse me, Ms. Ledlow, he's, he's uh, we're going to call him Mr. Mr. Keller. Gentlemen from Pennsylvania, Mr. Keller is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate all the work that is done by the Corporation for National and Community Service, or CNCS. Though eight out of nine material weaknesses identified in the fiscal year 2021 audit were first identified as early as fiscal year 2017, that makes it clear that CNCS programs, such as AmeriCorps, the Senior Companion Program, and others are in need of upgrade. Meanwhile, the latest version of President Biden's reconciliation bill includes $15.2 billion in additional funding, or roughly 15 times the annual budget of the CNCS. I started out, uh, right out of high school working in private industry. But in any sector, you would not expect to see such an increase. In fact, if you didn't see performance, you wouldn't see any, any additional money. You'd look at, at 
changing what the uh, uh, how they're doing things. But you wouldn't look at an increase in funding for something when you when you weren't seeing improvements. So, so that's not just private industry; that's also government. So we need to see dramatic improvement and fundamental change for the better. So I have a question uh, for Ms. Jeffrey. I want to thank you for being here today. And I understand that you recently released the annual audit of financial information from CNCS and the National Service Trust Fund, which found that the CNCS lacked responsiveness and did not disclose large amounts of necessary information required to complete the audit. Can you explain what type of information was missing or delayed and how that might have affected the OIG's report? It was, it was actually quite a bit of information of many different types that was missing. That's not asking good questions. In, in some cases, it was an issue of the, whether the population was complete so that the auditors could uh, select an appropriate sample. In some cases, they got financial information that was internally inconsistent, or in some cases, obviously wrong. Uh, they would point out the problems and it would take a great deal of time to get the correct information. That's not usual in the fifth year of an audit with the same auditor. Um, and, and our auditors told us this year was almost more like a first year with a new auditee than a fifth year with an auditee. Well, why? I guess I have a question. Were the same people providing the information this year that were providing it previously? So there's been there has been a lot of turnover, and that's unfortunate. And one of the key positions was left unfilled while an individual was on previously scheduled long-term military leave. Um, part of it is the information itself is not stored in a way that makes it easy to furnish. And so it's both an issue of the agency's capacity, of a lack of organization, and of defects in the systems. Uh, wh why would you think they wouldn't have the information stored so that it's easy to, easy to determine and, and, and find? Why would anybody not want that? I don't think it's a question of not wanting it. I think these systems were designed a very, very long time ago, um, and they have not been upgraded since. And that has been a major albatross around the agency's neck. I think they should put a priority in upgrading their systems, but I'll, I'll, I'll move on to other questions. Uh, again, Ms. Jeffrey, uh, do you believe additional congressional oversight would help the CNCS improve some of these troubling practices and help to stop wasting taxpayer dollars? I think more congressional oversight is very helpful in um, getting the agency to prioritize the things that Congress believes are important. Yeah, and, and just you mentioned about their inability to upgrade things and, and manage that well. So if they're not at managing those things well, do you believe that the CNCS is able to properly manage an additional $15 billion included in the Build Back Better Act? It's a challenge. Let me say a couple of things about that. Um, the $15 billion is over, I think it was a nine year period. I remember calculating that between the Build Back Better money, the ARP money, and um, certain interagency um, agreements, generally the agency's budget was rough, would roughly be quadrupled. So I think the 15 times over um, uh, figure may be um, an inapt comparison. Uh, yeah, but it's, the 15, other... it's 15, I, I mentioned it was 15 times their annual budget. It okay. is. I didn't say it was in a year's time. That's right. My point was it's 15 times their annual budget, but I'm concerned the taxpayers aren't getting the level of transparency and accountability they deserve from these audits and programs. The committee needs to ensure that the CNCS is achieving its valuable community service goals while also remaining responsible stewards of taxpayer dollars. I look forward to working with members of the committee toward solutions that will drive improvement and make sure that the money is invested well, rather than just going into an organization that isn't managed well. And with and that, we I look back. And we look forward to the support of Congress in helping the agency do that. Thank you. The gentleman's yield back. <clears throat> uh, the next, um, is, uh, let's see, we have Desanye, Norcross, Jaipal, Morelli, Wild, Macbeth, 
Gentlelady from Connecticut, Ms. Hayes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. AmeriCorps has a significant impact in Connecticut. Over the last 25 years, more than 2,500 residents have served over 3.6 million hours in my district. Last year, over 1,800 Americans of all ages and background met local needs, strengthened communities, and expanded economic opportunity through national service in Connecticut. In fact, I, they go on to pursue careers in public service and continue this essential work, underscoring the value of cultivating civic engagement. I currently have an AmeriCorps alumna on my office staff. My question today is for Mr. Jeffrey. Under the previous administration, AmeriCorps lost more than 100 staff, in large part due to a reorganization plan that led to a number of early retirements and positions not being filled. How much does that loss in personnel during this time impact the efficacy, the efficacy of AmeriCorps grant management? I think it's not only the loss of those staff members, but really the way in which the new field structure was created. Um, we have heard from a number of staff members in the field that the, the level of responsibility, the quantity of work is not doable and that they are spending a great deal of time basically processing paper um, and are not able to devote time to supporting grantees. And that's a huge loss, especially as the agency takes on programs that require them to recruit new grantees from um, underserved communities where those grantees may not have a lot of capacity. They really need more support. So it sounds like you're saying that some of the challenges we can attribute to the fact that not, I mean, if, if the staff are already overworked and then they're understaffed, that it's possible to see many of the gaps that we've heard about on this hearing. Well, I'm not sure how those contributed to some of the financial management issues, but I, and, but I think there are very valid concerns about the level of support that uh, the current field structure can provide to grantees. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cole, in a briefing provided by your staff, this committee was informed that AmeriCorps is conducting a workforce analysis to be completed in fiscal year 2022. This analysis was considered a crucial action step to address the staffing shortage that has accumulated over the preceding years. Can you tell us today what is the progress of this analysis and will it be completed? And are there any, um, any early indicators of guides for improvement uh, of capacity of the agency? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Congresswoman. Uh, we're very pleased to announce that we did make the award of our, our workforce analysis planning contract uh, within the past month, month and a half, perhaps. Uh, and so it is underway. We have a project manager we expect that the overall rollout will take 12 to 18 months, and it will inform us uh, with recommendations regarding our, our structure, how best to meet our mission, the type of skill sets, the volume of those skills that are going to be required, what can be achieved in-house, and what needs to be accessed externally. Uh, so it is going to be comprehensive, and it will vastly improve our ability to assign resources to our, meeting our mission. Well, Thank you, Mr. Cole, and that is critically important, especially at this time. I think what we're hearing a lot of today is that uh, we passed a bill in Congress because we believe in the long-term benefits of programs like AmeriCorps. We believe in service and we would like to invest in programs like this, but as members of Congress, we also have oversight responsibility. So it's very important that we can justify these uh, appropriating funds to to programs like AmeriCorps. So um, this study and then the follow-up of what is found and how we improve the agency is critically important because um, as you've heard so many of my Democratic colleagues say, uh, we do not believe that dis disbanding AmeriCorps completely is the approach that we should be taking. We should find the areas that are in need of improvement and support um, the agency to make sure that we make those improvements so that our communities can continue to benefit from programs like AmeriCorps. Um, but it's very important that we're also 
uh, responsible stewards of taxpayer dollars. So um, I look forward to the findings of this analysis and my time has expired, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you. The um, gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Banks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Coles, as you are aware, the reason we are having this hearing is because AmeriCorps' inability to provide auditors with the necessary information to conduct a full and thorough audit. This inability comes after an entire year's delay at the request of AmeriCorps. Mr. Cole, this is not the first time this agency has found itself in this situation, but I would like to think with an extra 12 months, the corporation and yourself would have been able to get your house in order. Mr. Coles, after two years of preparation, why was AmeriCorps unable to provide the necessary information to conduct a full audit? I think you're, you're muted. My apologies. Thank you for your question, Congressman. Yes, as I mentioned, one of the cornerstones of our corrective action plan was to sign a shared services agreement with ARC over at Treasury because they are essentially a gold standard to be able to meet financial management, procurement, and, and travel requirements that we lack the in-house capacity to perform. So having it be professionalized was a major step forward. We just completed our first full year of that shared services agreement. Uh, and so we don't have the data to, to basically reveal what sort of improvements have been made, which would certainly show up in the next year's audit. I would also say that the recurring theme here has been the recognition, I think, by all parties that historically we have been under-resourced in terms of our capacity to both meet our mission externally and to conduct the type of financial oversight that we essentially believe is required as much as you do. So we are- well, sir, always seems like This is about wanting more money, but it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of urgency here to perform the audit. Where, where is the urgency? Uh, there, was a, there was a mutual agreement between the Inspector General and us last year because of the migration of shared services uh, that we would not conduct an audit in FY20. Mr. Coles, because, because uh, AmeriCorps is funded through public funds, don't you agree that there should be accountability on behalf, on, on behalf of the American people who are funding this effort? I mean, where, where is the urgency for this audit? Uh, the, the, as I mentioned, uh, we are in receipt of the FY21 audit. Uh, even prior to that, because of the requirements of, of ARP and the PRAC, particularly around fraud awareness, we had set up internal systems with our risk management council to put together working groups and come up with that corrective action plannings that are responsive to the 75. Uh, so Mr. Coles, the, the excuses and the lack of urgency is a slap in the face to American taxpayers. Ms. Ms. Jeffrey, do you believe that AmeriCorps took the, uh, the actions and steps necessary to ensure it's prepared for the independent audit? I'm sorry, I, I lost a little bit of what you were saying. Do you, do you believe that AmeriCorps took the actions and steps necessary to ensure it was prepared for the independent audit? Obviously not. Yeah, I, and you would agree that there seems to be a full lack of, of urgency on their, port, and on their part to participate in the audit. There certainly has been over the last five years. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Mr. Coles, according to your bio, after setting up the corporation when it was created in 1993, you went on to hold senior level positions at the corporation, overseeing programs such as AmeriCorps VISTA and AmeriCorps Seniors Program, and most recently serving as executive advisor to the chief of programs operations. Do you believe that your expertise and tenure at the corporation was a key reason that you were appointed, appointed to serve as acting CEO? Uh, I do. I think having had the privilege and the honor to serve under 11 presidents and 16 administrations, that was an acknowledgement. I, I figured so. And serving in these roles, AmeriCorps' programs were and continue to be magnets for fraud, waste, and abuse. So why you are relatively new in your role as acting CEO, you are not new in the long stand, to the longstanding issues AmeriCorps has historically faced and in the inability of AmeriCorps leadership to do anything about them. Is that correct? We have historically had and continue to have a zero tolerance policy for grantees who commit illegal acts or perform prohibitive activities. And we have systems in place to hold individuals and organizations accountable when we discover those, including, mm -hmm. referring, including referring them to the Inspector General. 
Yeah, I, 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 I'll, I'll leave it at that. The, the excuses, the lack of urgency is embarrassing. It's a slap in the face to American taxpayers. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin. Thanks so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, AmeriCorps provides vital help to communities throughout the nation during the most difficult of moments. AmeriCorps members and volunteers should be proud of the work they facilitate across our communities, including helping the most vulnerable during the COVID-19 pandemic and cleaning up during nat natural disasters like wildfires out west and windstorms in the Midwest. So it's, it's really important to laud the successes of the program, but we have to take very seriously management issues. And as members of Congress, our oversight duties need to uh, focus on the, what's needed for the future success of the program. AmeriCorps has gone through four audits by the Office of the Inspector General, which resulted in deeply troubling findings. For AmeriCorps to continue the good work it does and expand it, its financial and administrative health must be safeguarded. Now, in the FY 2021 AmeriCorps Annual Management Report, the agency's external auditors noted that 10 out of the 75 recommendations were now closed for AmeriCorps and seven out of 37 recommendations were now closed for the National Service Trust. Ms. Jeffries, Jeffrey, excuse me, what additional steps would you recommend the agency put into effect to address the auditor's concerns? And in particular, I wanna press you on timelines. Look, I used to run the, all the workforce programs of the state of Michigan. I dealt with all, you know, AmeriCorps, all the WIOA programs. I had uh, mismanagement and corruption and we dealt with it in a super urgent basis. The idea of this going on for years or taking years to correct was something I did not accept as a steward of the taxpayers dollars of the state of Michigan. So give me a sense of timing here. Can't AmeriCorps come into compliance with what it needs to do within say one year from now? I think it could make a lot of good progress um, and a lot of needed progress. Uh, it's certainly not gonna get to a clean opinion within one year, partly because so many of the problems relate to technology. Um, and relate to financial systems that need to be upgraded. And the timeline for implementing those changes, regrettably, is, is definitely gonna be longer than a year. Regardless of resources. Resources given, will- Given help. unlimited funding, it would still take more than a year. Resources will help accelerate things, but I'm telling you just the procurement timelines that exist um, and the need to hire people and the, the typical lag time in those processes means it is bound to take more than a year. Okay, Mr. Coles, you're, I salute your efforts to address the audit findings and I wanna dive into the current steps that you're taking. Um, in the agency's FY 2021 annual management report, one of the main ways the agency proposed to be able to address the audit findings is by creating a new internal audit accountability and reporting structure, which is supported by the existing Risk Management Council. Could you explain this new accountability and reporting structure? And I want to really emphasize, again, based on my own experience, to the average citizen, sir, this can sound like a bunch of gobbledygook and a, a lot of happy talk. Um, what, you know, you've said accountability starts at the top. So talk to us about how you are going to grab this bull by the horns personally and wrestle it to the ground so that we can all be super proud of the amazing work that can happen through AmeriCorps. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Uh, let me first underscore, we do have a sense of urgency here and I do take it personally. Uh, the, the issue is that we recognize that we need to get traction really fast. Uh, the issue is also that we're relying upon our risk management council, uh, which is a, a group of senior managers comprised of our, our CFO, our chief uh, risk officer, our chief information officer, and other senior officials. But the fact of the matter is, this has to be agency wide. But our sense of urgency is such that was the group, the risk management council, that ushered in success for us on the issues me mentioned before. 
our, our best leap forward in terms of compliance on criminal history checks and the establishment of a risk-based monitoring system that we believe will truly deliver on effectiveness. Those are instances in which that group has set a foundational path for us to take on further corrective action planning. So they will be at the epicenter, but all of us, all of us will be expected to contribute. All right, well, Mr. Chairman, it looks like my time is expiring. Let me just say that we have passed the Build Back Better Act in the House. I certainly hope the Senate passes it. If so, we are giving a lot more resources uh, to your agency, including a lot more for ma internal management. And I uh, hope and trust you'll use it wisely and aggressively uh, to take care of these problems. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, gentleman from North Carolina, Dr. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I wanna thank our uh, guests for coming on today. I will tell you, um, you know, I've just been listening to a lot of the testimony and a lot of the problems that I've heard. And I can think I can say, and this is a bipartisan notion that if, if, uh, if this was a private corporation that we were dealing with, you would long since be bankrupt and out of business. This just, uh, this uh, malfeasance, if it is uh, the case, would just not be tolerated and uh, you guys would be gone. So. Um, I appreciate the auditing and work that it's done. Before I really actually get my questions, I want to ask two quick ones. Uh, Mr. Coles, you had mentioned to Representative uh, Grothman earlier that a billion dollars with a B was going to try to clear up, was going to you guys to try to clear up the financial situation. Can you, uh, can you expand upon that just a little bit? Uh, yes, the, the, the bill, the BBB that was passed by the House of Representatives has naturally a 15.2 billion price tag. One of the lines in there is for a little over $1 billion. Uh, and it is dedicated to focusing on remediation of already acknowledged audit uh, deficiencies. Uh, the need for us to do, as long as we're cleaning up our business, we need significant investments. So that's one part of the billion dollars. Another part of that is to stand up the sort of front end broad risk protection controls required by both ARP and required for strong stewardship going forward. All right, uh, thank you. That number is simply unconscionable to me that it, we're gonna spend a billion dollars on a billion dollar agency to get its financial house in order. I, I, I'm sorry, I just, I'm not really, I don't think I'm stupid. I just, I find that very, very difficult to comprehend. Um, uh, Ms. Jeffrey, uh, real quick, you, you had talked earlier about some uh, specific examples, again, that uh, Representative Brothman brought up of Hawaii, North Carolina, which concerns me specifically, actually, East Carolina. Well, do, to your knowledge, were there criminal charges brought uh, for those individuals who committed the fraud? So there, are cr there were criminal charges brought and guilty pleas of three people in the Hawaii matter. Okay. What about in North Carolina? Are you aware of that? That was not a criminal matter. Okay, um, go back to, to Mr. Coles. Uh, when we have individuals to your knowledge who are being introduced to this program, not as volunteers, but as paid participants, are they made aware that fraudulent activity will be met with criminal charges? They are indeed. It is part of every orientation of every incoming AmeriCorps member about prohibitive activities and, and the, the, the risks associated with violating laws, quite honestly. Yeah. Um, you know, this is just, a, I have to say, this is a, kind of the paradigm that we see with good intent of government programs, but this is what happens when there's lack of oversight and money after money after money rather than oversight. We think we fix a problem now pouring $15 billion, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm even blown away about $1 billion into a program that has just repeatedly shown um, that it is... Uh, it is not working as far as uh, financial activity and criminal activity. Um, I'm just, uh, I'm baffled about that. It would be sad for this program to go away because of the good that it does, but the, the fact that there has been no financial accounting, um, I don't care about the excuses. I'm sorry, I don't live in a world where excuses like that matter, especially repeatedly over years and years and years um, can occur. So quickly, I, I just, uh, you know, we talked about all these different things. Ms. Jeffrey, um, you, you've provided an audit or at least an oversight uh, to this institution. Let me ask you this, and this is kind of a, a hard question to answer. Is this, uh, is this survivable? Um, in other words, is this an investment that the American people should continue to make 
And in your judgment, should we be spending $15 billion on an agency where we know has not been very good about with the taxpayer money? So to a great degree, that question is above my pay grade and it really lands in the lap of Congress. Um, I think the answer depends on what you, how much you value the work of the programs and how much risk you're willing to take on to, in order for that work to continue. Now, to my way of thinking, the, the financial management improvements are a must. Um, they are essential, they're non-optional. Um, if you value the work of the programs, you might say we are willing to invest another two years to see if we can get to where we are. But I do understand a sense of great impatience on the part of the Congress and the American people yeah. to say, why should we keep supporting an organization that cannot produce transparent and accountable financial information for the public? Thank you, Ms. Jeffrey. My time is up, but I, I could not agree with that more. I mean, this it's, it's sad that uh, this particular program is put in jeopardy because of, uh, of lack of oversight. And again, this is where government gets it wrong. We think pouring more money at something is going to fix it rather than accountability. But with that, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will yield back. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. The gentlelady from Michigan, Ms. Stevens. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Pools, do you happen to know the average age of an AmeriCorps participant? I'm not sure I can provide the average age. I can I can certainly let you know that the majority of the participants fall in the age range of 18 to 25, uh, but it's it's yeah. uh, that's that's uh, pretty common. Yeah, it's fair to say it's a it's a program for for young people and. Is a, is a point of personal privilege as a member of this committee participating in this hearing. I, I just can't help but reflect that yesterday we had a um, just a terrible shooting in Michigan and we lost three young people who could have been participating in AmeriCorps. And as we're evaluating this program and as we're evaluating how to create experiences for young people in America to become leaders, we've got to address gun violence in this country. 22 years since Columbine and we do nothing. And here we are evaluating and reviewing a program that is for young people. And we've got to think bigger and we've got to think about how we ensure the safety so that what happened at Oxford High School yesterday in Michigan never happens again. Now, I'm a former treasury appointee and I, I'm aware of you know this point about the administrative research resource center within the Department of Treasury that the that the audit is recommending, and I'm especially eager. I, I know Mr. Banks briefly touched on this, but I'm especially eager to know what services will be covered by the administrative resource center. Uh, Congressman, yes, in particular, uh, they fall into the current agreement into four areas. One is a vast array of financial management services, which we really lack the sort of depth and capacity to provide as a small agency. Second is around procurement, uh, which is quite frankly a major league deal uh, in the federal government. And third is around our, our, our travel services. But as importantly, as was alluded to a number of times here, we have antiquated legacy technology systems. And what we really need to do is to move forward to a single financial platform that's going to be integrated with ARC's financial platform. They use Oracle, it's a little wonky, I realize. But the gist of it is we have recently signed at the end of September a $3.6 million phase two agreement with ARC to help us both manage the transition of data migration for the short run on two systems, but ultimately to move to construct that one unified system that integrates and interfaces with theirs. And Mr. So Holtz, when, when this transition is completed, will that help address or resolve the audit recommendations? It, it, will, it will be a major fundamental piece of that because as was mentioned earlier, the inability of our current systems to provide reliable data on an on-time basis is, is, a, is a close to fatal flaw. Uh, and in concert with upgrading uh, both internally and externally, 
our human capital to be able to evaluate and manage data analysis. I think those will be the two sides of the coin that lead to that solution. Okay, and so the, the auditors found that transition caused some of the disruption in, in the AmeriCorps and that the transition is also a, a material weakness. So, right. you know, how is AmeriCorps, you know, effectuating this? Yeah, that, you know, that was, uh, let me turn on to go. That, that was the, the last point that I was making is that we have a, an antiquated system called Momentum. Yeah. It, it does not crank it does not interface, it does not feed data and can't into the Oracle system. So we need to maintain them separate systems for the time being while we're also going about the business of constructing that single unified platform that allows our new modernization technology systems to directly talk to or interface with ARC. Yeah, and you know, I can vouch for the Treasury Department's um, resources and, and, and I think that approach actually will, will prove to be Pretty, pretty successful here. And um, I'm going to yield back the re remainder of my time. I got about 20 seconds left. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next will be my distinguished colleague from Virginia, Mr. Good. Thank you, my distinguished chairman from Virginia. Thank you, Chairman Scott, Ranking Member Fox, for holding the hearing. And I thank also our witnesses, Mr. Jeffrey, Mr. Coles, and for your participation today. Uh, I have 17 years of experience in the financial sector, and I would submit that if we had run our company the way AmeriCorps has been run, uh, we would have been fired if we weren't already bankrupt. Uh, if AmeriCorps, AmeriCorps were a, a, a public uh, a privately held entity, it certainly would have gone insolvent some time ago by the way it's been operating. Uh, the recent audit of your agency states that you have made, quote, little progress at correcting the pervasive problems that have left the, end quote, that have left the agency unable to produce auditable financial material for the last five years. In addition, after the 2019 AmeriCorps audit, 75 recommendations were given to improve the agency's performance. However, only 10 of the recommendations were implemented. I think by any objective assessment, that is a failing grade. Mr. Jeffrey, will you please explain the, the agency's inability to respond to more than 60 of the recommendations regarding how to more efficiently and effectively use taxpayer dollars? I'm not sure I can offer you an explanation because this was certainly not what I expected to see. Um, to me, I agree with you, this should have been an all hands on deck emergency. It should have been that way after the first year, uh, but the agency just hasn't put resources and hasn't put attention into this. And while I agree very much with Mal Coles that resources were not um, thick on the ground here, let me note that during that same 2019-2020 period, when very little happened here, the agency spent $3.9 million to create a new grant system that it's never going to use. If so I may I interject, is, is there a reason to expect that the agency will adapt and improve in the future based on the past? You know, I would have to say that I think there are two things here that argue in favor of that. One of them is the level of interest from this committee. And I, I think the mandate of this committee uh, is having a profound effect on the agency. The second one is, I think it does make a difference that the agency is now in an environment when it is getting support and resources from the administration and from OMB. And it's wow. that that keeps me uh, potentially optimistic uh, that we may get a different result. Thank you, Ms. Jeffrey. Uh, to be honest, I would advocate for elimination of the program, but uh, I think at the very least, the question is, would, uh, would a smaller budget help? Because the most recent audit report, consistent with every other report published by your office or the GAO in the last decade, il illustrates a troubling pattern. Addressing financial management clearly does not seem to be a priority currently or in the past. And again, if after all these years, the agency is not prioritizing the necessary steps to ensure taxpayer dollars are used efficiently and effectively and appropriately, I don't know how anyone can expect uh, reasonably that there'd be anything different going forward. Uh, do you think that what we need is additional oversight in order to have improvement? 
I think the more oversight, the better, because it keeps people motivated. I mean, all agencies respond to congressional oversight. How about just to have a smaller budget? If we reduce the budget, would that help to be able to keep up with the accountability if we just had a smaller budget to oversee? Uh, I'm not sure that it would. I really uh, can't you, speak to that. Do you agree that the lack of strict accountability measures and the fact that AmeriCorps has never faced consequences for its actions sends a message that the proper stewardship of taxpayer dollars is not a priority? I do agree with that. Well, thank you for that. Th appreciate that. And, and as, as I hope you're well aware, an internal survey, survey of the three senior corps programs found that 10.6 million or a full one third of the budget was spent on members and staff with inadequate criminal background checks. In one instance, over 46 individuals were apparently working in the foster grandparent program and the senior companion program without the appropriate background checks. Are you concerned, Ms. Jeffrey, these inadequate background checks are putting Americans in danger who are being served by AmeriCorps? I think you're that has been a constant refrain uh, of my office, the need to upgrade the criminal history checks. And we have actually found instances in which convicted sex offenders had access to members of vulnerable populations because the checks were not performed properly. Well, I appreciate your answers today. And as a small government conservative, I'm skeptical of the need for the programs like these. And again, I would honestly advocate for elimination, but at a minimum, there should at least be an increase in accountability on government funding and how it's being spent. Thank you, Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Chairman, you're on mute. Okay, now the gentlelady lady from North Carolina, Ms. Manning. Thank you, Chairman Scott. Thank you for holding this important hearing. And I wanna thank our witnesses for addressing some very tough issues head on. Inspector General Jeffrey, Clearly, we've touched on some serious staffing issues, and we know that AmeriCorps is in the process of and will need to take additional steps to address the major shortages of agency staff, shortages caused by the Trump administration's continued attacks on the agency. Do you have recommendations on what roles AmeriCorps should be prioritizing for hiring and onboarding based on both the existing opportunities for improvement as well as the additional resources and grant making activities the agency will be carrying out? So I think the field staff clearly needs to be increased. Um, they are at the breaking point now. Um, I don't think we can afford to wait for the results of a workforce study that we might have in you know, nine months and then we have to make decisions and then we have to ramp up hiring. We know that needs to happen now. The same thing is true about um, the financial staff. And I think that when it comes to agency operations, the agency needs to look outside its existing ranks to recruit people who have management experience um, and have not, if you will, grown up in an environment that's dysfunctional. Um, those would be uh, my principal areas. I, I, but let me say one more thing. I think the agency needs to rethink the manner in which it performs grant monitoring. It focuses to much too great a degree on compliance and not enough focus on substance. Um, we have talked to the Department of Monitoring about it. Uh, I'm not sure they really get that, but they've said they'll think about it. Um, I think that that is a serious need and is important to protect the integrity of program funds. Thank you. And can you speak to ways, uh, has AmeriCorps improved staff experience and training? So this is a really interesting question. Um, AmeriCorps provided a great deal of training for the new field staff that it onboarded. Um, but we knew from the beginning that the best way you learn from people is to have someone who's knowledgeable sitting next to you and working with you. And a lot of the feedback that we're getting is, gee, that, that two weeks of training was really nice, 
but it's drinking out of a fire hose. I need to learn from colleagues. And when the colleagues are, you know, just one chapter in the book ahead of me, that's not useful learning. So I think they may need specialists in each of the regional offices um, to facilitate the learning that needs to take place. And are you suggesting that these specialists would need to be people who are brought in from the outside who have some of the skills that perhaps are currently lacking? So I think what we are really talking about are the skills for, um, uh, for assisting grantees in their financial management and assisting grantees in their programmatic activities. Um, there, you know, a lot of the people who left the agency in that reduction in force were people with those skills. Uh, and that's a darn shame. So is there an option, do you believe, of going back to some of these people who had those good skills, bringing them back in? I think it is worth exploring because I know a lot of those people left with the utmost reluctance and were deeply committed to seeing grantees function appropriately. You mentioned financial skills, you mentioned management skills. Are there other skills you think the agency should be focusing on acquiring, particularly uh, in the next six months? I think project management skills are essential. All of these reforms will require great project management. And that involves accountability, it involves tracking, it involves the ability to look at an entire program and see here's the weakness, here's what's not performing, here's where I need to intervene to deal with an obstacle. I'm not sure there are, there are many people, if any, in the agency with that suite of skills, and I think it's critical. But were there people who had those skills prior to the re reduction in force? Uh, if there were, there were not many. I do not think so. Thank you. Uh, my time is about to expire. I yield back. Thank you. The uh, gentlelady from Iowa, Ms. Uh, Dr. Miller Meeks. Thank you, Chairman Scott. And uh, thank you for the panelists who are here presenting today. Uh, as a, a new member of Congress, um, having met as a state senator with members from AmeriCorps, members from RSVP, uh, these findings and the findings in the OIG report are just profoundly disappointing. Um, and I think the fact that we're talking about increasing budgets and increasing allocations or appropriations to an agency who has year over year at, over year shown that it is not um, accountable to anyone and it is not interested in getting its financial house in order is a disservice uh, to both the organization, uh, to those uh, who had an intent to set up this organization as to recruit uh, volunteers to help in various uh, different endeavors. Uh, and it's a disservice to taxpayers. I found it unconscionable that we would be considering giving more money to an organization that has such little um, recognition uh, over uh, its financial resources that has been granted through the taxpayers of the United States. So, um, so I wanna say that uh, up front, having met with people who, uh, who have worked in these areas, uh, respected them and uh, would like to support them, uh, I don't find that that's a valuable way to spend taxpayer money uh, if we continue along this track. You can't hold organizations accountable if your answer to accountability is to give them more funding. Um, with that, I'm gonna direct my, my question to a different area, which I don't think has been addressed yet, but as, as a member of Homeland Security, this is a very important area to us as well. So Ms. Jeffrey, according to your testimony, AmeriCorps' cybersecurity program is not effective in its current state, and the independent audit once again found a significant deficiency in the security of AmeriCorps' financial systems. And we already know that other, other government agencies have had breaches and have released uh, private information uh, when it was not intended to include social security numbers. So moreover, the audit found significant issues related to AmeriCorps security management, contingency planning, and control over access to agency data and information. All of this leaves the agency very vulnerable to a cyber attack, potentially allowing bad actors access to hundreds of thousands of individuals' personal um, identifiable information. So can you describe the key vulnerabilities in AmeriCorps' information technology system? How long has AmeriCorps been aware of these issues? And then um, how can they be addressed? 
So annually, um, IGs throughout the federal government do two things. They look at the security of financial systems as part of the financial statement audit, and they do a separate evaluation of information security programs throughout all phases of the agency. Um, AmeriCorps has basically been stuck where it is at a relatively low level um, since 2018. They made some progress between 2017 and 2018, but they've pretty much stood still since then. Um, they have, there has been some improvement, but not enough to move the needle. And it's frightening. And uh, is there, you know, potential consequences if these issues aren't addressed? Could you comment on that? I mean, the potential consequences include a, a breach and, you know, unauthorized release of information. Um, if that happens, the agency not only takes a profound and possibly fatal blow to its reputation, uh, but also the economic costs of remediation in terms of credit monitoring, monitoring uh, et cetera, could be ruinous. Um, you know, there are lots of agencies have had breaches, but we don't really have any choice about whether we deal with the Social Security Administration. People have a choice about whether to engage with AmeriCorps. Um, and if AmeriCorps can't safeguard their information, they may just kind of vote with their feet and go elsewhere. So uh, what, I'm, what I'm hearing is not only is there a lackadaisical approach to the uh, revenues that they have, they have no outcome measures for the programs that they have that they could elucidate to their success other than the numbers of individuals that they reach, but they also have a lack, lackadaisical approach to the uh, personal identifiable information of other citizens and people who come in contact with the agency. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. I yield back my time. Thank you. The um, gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Mervin. Thank you, Chairman. Ms. Jeffrey, uh, the Build Back Better bill, uh, the Build Back Better Act requires the CNCS develop a robust project operations and management plan to be completed within 180 days of enactment of the, B the BBB in consultation with the CNCS OIG. What steps will your office take to help ensure this plan incorporates the necessary protections for responsible stewardships of taxpayer dollars in the implementation of the Build Back Better funds at CNCS? So, uh, so there are a couple of ways we can contribute to that. One of them is to make sure that um, the plan includes appropriate corrective actions for the recommendations that we've seen in the financial statement audit and in the information security audits. Another thing is to um, provide you critical information about anti-fraud measures that the agency should be taking. And my office is currently working on a report that will um, offer a number of very practical solutions, some of which have been adopted at other agencies uh, to help our grantees stay out of trouble. Can you do me a favor and define critical information? Critical, inf I'm sorry, I know I used the phrase, but I can't remember in what context now. Critical but you just said that you would want to make sure that there is outcomes and you have, as your agency is uh, guiding critical information and being able to protect that and providing them with that. You're muted, I'm so sorry. Me. Sorry about that. I think our office can provide critical learning to the agency about effective measures to prevent and detect fraud and to assist our grantees in adopting anti-fraud measures. And that would be obviously strong internal controls and also segregation of duties as examples, correct? Uh, among those things, what I would like to do is um, offer them some sort of practical things. In other words, not follow the rules, but you will be better off if you do things this way rather than that way. Here is a tool you can use to make this work better. 
And to, if I could, um, Congresswoman Miller Meeks asked a question, and Ms. Jeffries, uh, Ms. Jeffrey, you had answered that um, as far as the breaches of technology, that there are some things that they have made improvements on. What are some of those things they've made improvements on? So there, every year, the um, FISMA evaluation looks at the number of critical risks and high risks um, in terms of um, configuration management, things that need to be patched but aren't. Um, the agency reduced those critical and high risk items by about 75%, if memory serves, in the last year. Now, there are still way too many of them, okay? but they made some real strides in the last so, year in terms of reducing them. So they did make strides on protecting the data that they have by 75% of the critical risks that they had. Correct, but not it's still not enough. They've got to get to 100% of those. Right, it is. It, all of us are working towards perfection every single day. But I do thank you very much, and I appreciate all that you've done. With that, I yield back. Thank you. Um, Chair Lady from Illinois, Ms. Miller. Thank you. Mr. Coles, a 2016 report showed that AmeriCorps funds were used for abortion services, which is illegal. The report showed that AmeriCorps employees were providing services at three New York City clinics operated by the Institute for Family Health. Are you aware that AmeriCorps funds were used to provide abortion services in violation of federal law? Thank you for the question, Congresswoman. As I mentioned earlier, we have zero tolerance, zero tolerance policy for grantees who knowingly engage in prohibited activities or commit illegal acts. We have systems in place to hold them accountable, and we do, including referring them to the Inspector General. So whenever there's an instance we are quick to be responsive. Thank you. But even if there have been steps taken by the organization to address these illegal practices, how can we know that they have actually stopped without having proper accountability? Can you assure the committee that these practices have been stopped? I can assure you that when instances of allegations of violations are brought to our attention, uh, that, we, that we take a look at them internally and based upon the severity of them, we do refer them for investigation to our inspector general. Uh, it is our uh, fervent uh, belief and our, our strong practice to tolerate none of that. With all due respect, sir, you cannot make such a claim because without a proper audit and accountability, we have no idea where all the funds are going. We should not be awarding funds that could go toward abortion services. Thank you, and I yield back. Would the channel lady yield for a question? Yes, I, I yield my time. Thank you. Mr. Cole, I wanna follow up on what Congresswoman Miller was saying. She is exactly right. You can, you, you're on the wrong track on this. I want to know how you're gonna ensure that grantees are not engaging in illegal activity to begin with. Your question was extraordinarily weak on this. Stop it from happening. That's what we want. Don't allow it to happen. So what are you gonna to do to keep it from happening? Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, part of the foundation of our revised risk-based grants management system uh, is a provision at the upfront application process. When applications for resources first come in, they are thoroughly reviewed for risk exposure, programmatic, uh, financial, and fraud. And we are very, very careful and keen to make sure that the profile of an organization that applies for our resources does not position them, in a, position them or us in a way that will expose us to violations. 
Okay, let me follow up on that. So how often does the corporation conduct a comprehensive review of all grantees? And if such a comprehensive review has never been initiated, what do you plan on, when do you plan on conducting such an analysis? We conduct this evaluation and assessment each year. On every single grantee? On every single incoming grantee. Usually it's a three year no, cycle. No, I didn't, uh, not on incoming, on all grantees. Mm -hmm. On we, all grantees. We identify them based upon the risk factors that are built into our, our system to detect lack of compliance, and we prioritize those that surface mm -hmm. for a, a deeper dive. Uh, Ms. Jeffrey, have you analyzed this risk factor issue that Mr. Coles is talking about? And if not, I don't know if it's the role of the Inspector General to do that or not, but who is doing that and how do we know whether they have identified the correct risk factors? So that is a major challenge and it's a question that we have been asking. Um, right now, the risk model was developed by the, um, by the chief risk officer and her staff, we had some input in terms of information, but we think there are better ways to gather data about what's actually going on at the subgrantee level. And one of the things we have been recommending for years is a use of surveys, because you can reach more members who will tell you what is actually happening on the ground. And that's really important. The agency does a good job, I think, of having its grantees teach people what are the prohibited activities. But whether they really internalize that information and whether they follow the rules, that's something we need to do more to determine, and we've got to do that directly. Well, Ms. Jeffrey and Mr. Coles, I can tell you I'm going to be delving into this a lot more on an individual basis with both of you. This committee cannot tolerate this kind of abuse, illegal activity, and abuse of, of taxpayer dollars. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back to Ms. Miller. Generally's time, generally's time has expired. Um, I think we have several um, uh, Republicans left, um, many more than Republicans. So we'll go to Ms. Sparks. Uh, next, John Lady from Indiana is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've been listening, you know, as a former Big Four auditor that audited Fortune 500 companies when I read this report. And Jeffrey, my quick question for you, if a publicly traded company would have a disclaimer of opinion and material weaknesses and controls, I don't know what kind of risk assessment they do and they definitely not working, what would happen? to publicly try the type of auditor would disclaim an opinion? I think you would see a wholesale resignation or firing of the leadership team. Uh, and I think the rest of us would be shorting their stock. That's right. And I don't think we would be given more money. It's that we give billion dollars this year. And that's the recent bill proposes over 15 billion to give more. So I think this is really unbelievable for me to hear that. But I have a quick question for you, uh, and as Samson, maybe I would like to look, I'm a court chair of CPA caucus, and I'm my, you know, really looking how the government is audited, it just <laughs> breaks my heart to see that it's nothing is auditable, you know, and one of the things that I came across, and I wanted to get your opinion, when I was actually uh, in the state senate, I was chair audit committee, and we were trying to align our state legislation for auditing with the federal legislation, and I was surprised to learn that there is an exception for transparency transaction, individual transaction under 750,000 for auditing. And I felt that is actually posed significant fraud risk. That's why Enron happened. If I would want to commit fraud, I'll make sure that I have several nonprofits, maybe 10 of them get half a million each, and then I can funnel 5 million. And my risk, you know, my likelihood of being audited is going to be very remote. So do you believe we need to prescribe more on predictability procedures, you know, for that it's actually, you know, there is some deterrence of fraud. And also, what can we do to improve that you actually can do a better job as inspector general or maybe looking at quality control and better auditing the auditors and engaging more auditors because we're dealing with big money here and it's significant public interest. So you've raised a question about the single audit threshold. 
Um, there were a number of us in the IG community who were against raising the threshold to 750 billion for just the reason that you indicate. Uh, but OMB chose to raise it because figuring that the greatest risk is where the greatest dollars are involved. Um, that puts more of the burden on individual OIGs to do uh, more work. It puts more of the burden on agencies to do better monitoring. Um, and those are both challenges. Uh, I, I think there can be a lot better coordination between the federal inspector general community and the states. And that is actually something that the Council on Inspectors General for Integrity and Efficiency is currently pursuing. So we try our best to work with state auditors on these issues. If we're finding problems at a grantee, chances are the state either ought to look at it or may have already known about problems. And so we want to share information. So from your perspective, if you would improve, because when I look at this, this is a complete failure of an agency. And I'm sure there are a lot of other ones like that too. You know, when I look at these disclaimers of opinions, what do you think, we, how can we make sure that the actually agency do have better control system, internal controls, preventative and detective in place that they provide this, you know, processes before we find the fraud. Otherwise it's impossible to be able to audit it to the level and express an opinion. So how can, what do we need to do? So I don't think fraud was the real barrier to getting an opinion on the financial statements. Um, I think the agency needs to do more to prevent and detect fraud, but that wasn't the major impediment here. There's a lot the agency can do a better job of preventing and detecting fraud, particularly in the grant area. That was a priority in the prior administration. It is continuing as a priority in this administration. And the IGs are working with OMB and with um, uh, the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee and with the ARP implementation team in the White House to ensure that there are stronger anti-fraud measures. Well, I think risk of fraud cannot be mitigated to acceptable level if controls are in place. And if we have, you know, uh, in, in this case, you know, material weaknesses, so definitely the system is not functioning. But from your perspective as an agency, what tools and mechanisms would help you? And maybe we need to utilize technology better to actually do a better job dealing with agencies like this one. So fortunately, AmeriCorps situation is not common across the federal government and clearly better technology is necessary. AmeriCorps has had this non-compliant um, accounting system since time immemorial. Um, and that needs to change. And as, as Mr. Coles just testified, the agency has entered into an agreement with the administrative resource system that will discontinue the non-compliant system yeah, and upgrade right. everything to ARC's compliant system, which I think will be a very positive development. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, the, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Bowman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all the witnesses for being here today. I want to start by recognizing the 542 AmeriCorps members and volunteers in my district, which covers the Bronx and Westchester, New York. From Vista working with groundwork, Hudson Valley to Yonkers and Yonkers to foster grandparent volunteers at the New York City Department for the Aging to the RSVP of Westchester Volunteer Center at Home on the Sound in Mamaroneck. Volunteers of all ages in my district are engaging and giving back to the community in so many positive ways. For a program that was funded at around 1.1 billion for fiscal year 2021, which is a relatively small amount compared to other nationwide programs, it's clear to me that CNCS and national service in general is a multiple for good. In my district just a few months ago, Hurricane Ida wrecked historic damage throughout the Bronx and Westchester. We lost lives in our communities because of the storm. Entire homes flooded with severe, with several feet of water, more than any typical heavy storm. But that's the thing, these increasingly severe storms are becoming more frequent and causing more damage than ever before because we are in a climate crisis. 
my constituents are still reeling from this trauma on the long road to repair and recovery. I saw the damage myself standing in my constituents' homes and small businesses and houses of worship where everything they owned had been destroyed. I couldn't help but think volunteers from a unified, well-funded, diverse civilian climate corps would be extremely helpful in my district right now. The agreed upon 15.22 billion for AmeriCorps and the House Pass Build Back Better Act will create 400,000 CCC service positions, allow us to increase the education awards of all participants for five years to 10,500 and raise the wages of all participants for five years to $15 an hour. I also wanna associate myself with the comments of Representative Haley Stevens earlier uh, connecting the lack of opportunity and hope uh, to the mass shooting that just happened in a Michigan high school. Uh, this program focuses on providing opportunities for young people, and there are millions of young people across this country who yearn for opportunities like this as a pathway uh, to success and serve in their communities, especially in the area uh, of dealing with climate, the climate catastrophe that we're living in. Uh, we did our part in the House 12 days ago when we passed the Build Back Better Act, and now it's on the Senate to pass it next. Uh, Mr. Coles, uh, thank you for being here today and for your efforts as the acting CEO. I look forward to CNCS benefiting from President Biden's nominations and a fully filled board with people dedicated to community service and undoing the Trump administration's effort to sabotage AmeriCorps. Can you just speak openly and generally about the importance of national service and why it matters. Uh, Congressman, thank you for, for your question. Uh, national service is actually the, the greatest illustration of a win-win proposition, I think, that we have here in American society. It's the opportunity for individuals to become engaged in the creative problem solving processes in their own communities. Uh, and in doing so, actually develop skills, capacity, and, and relationships that allow them to further propel themselves in their own career development. So it's the dual victory of having community outcomes be realized through national service and the investment takeaway from the individual participating so that she or he can be launched forward uh, for a successful career. Underlying that as well is the, the opportunity to, to share common experiences with individuals that you might not opportunity have an opportunity to do so in your, in your regular life. And it also allows you to, to sort of savor and to develop that lifelong contribution of civic engagement. So thank you very much for that. Um, can you briefly speak to what more is possible uh, within the agency with an increase in funding? What more could you do? Uh, we're, again, we're very thankful for the investments that have been made, uh, regular order with ARP uh, and what's projected for uh, Build Back Better. I think those are all areas in which we have uh, proven tr track records. And so we're very anxious to be able to sort of expand out on the initiatives that we have demonstrated success on. So we're, we're very eager to do so. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. The uh, general from Wisconsin, Mr. Fitzgerald. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I might, you know, at, at, at this point, oftentimes there's a redundancy and some of the questions are being asked. So. Uh, one of the things I was curious about, and um, obviously, I don't think anybody asked directly. So question for the Inspector General, Inspector General Jeffrey. So this is this is an annual report, and, and I'm brand new to this, just got elected last November. So this is an annual uh, audit and then report that's, is, is that accurate? That's correct. So what what was discovered in the last audit that was not fixed? Were there specific items that were identified as, as needing to be addressed and, and then it was either ignored? 
or what what does that list look like? So um, most of the material weaknesses that were identified in 2021 date back either to 2017 or 2018. Some of the underlying problems date back much further than that. Um, these are these didn't arise, you know, quickly. Uh, but the agency has not moved effectively to solve those problems. Yeah, I, I would expect, I mean, with your job in that position, you know, it, it's, and we, it, there were a couple of members that talked about it earlier. It's not exactly an exciting thing for somebody to say, we're here again to do your annual uh, audit. Um, let me ask you this. If, um, if there are actions that are taken, what's the uh, what's the follow through? How how does that work? And and are there any consequences for not for not uh, making changes or complying? I get quote unquote. I'll say complying with um, you know what has been in place uh, as a result of an audit and recommendations. So as an inspector general, my only authority is to make recommendations and to publicize information. I can't require the agency to act. Um, what I can do is tell Congress and the public about where the problems are. Um, whether the agency has its own accountability measures, you know, that's up to the agency. So far, they haven't seemed to produce real returns. So I think by any measure, the accountability has been um, insufficient and ineffective. Uh, very good. So I guess I'd ask Chairman Scott, Chairman, wh wh what do you think, uh, you know, is there, is there something, it, you know, I don't wanna make it seem like we're chasing our tail here. If there's an annual audit, recommendations come, findings are made, and then, you know, un unfortunately there's no action. I mean, I, it, it seems like obviously a bipartisan thing that, everybody would have an interest in trying to tackle and, and make some changes here. I'm just curious what, what your thoughts are on that. Well, the, thank you, the gentleman uh, yielding. The purpose of this hearing is according to the rules, if, a, if an agency has an audit where the, I think the technical term is uh, where the opinion is disclaimed uh, by the uh, auditors, the committee of jurisdiction is required to have a hearing. Although this has been going on for a couple of years, as during my chairmanship, the first notice I got was in the middle of the pandemic um, last year, and we didn't um, have such a hearing, but we had another disclaimed audit this year. And so we we're obligated to have a hearing this year, and that's why we're having this hearing. It'd be my uh, ex expectation to um, continue having hearings that um, the um, uh, Acting uh, CEO has indicated a willingness to have what they call um, uh, CAPs um, uh, to um, um, set objective standards to make so we can follow the uh, process to make sure they're actually fixing the problems. And so this is not expected to be the last hearing on this issue. Yeah, I would just say I, I would urge, obviously, working with with uh, ranking member Fox and, and other members that have an interest in this topic that, um, you know, hopefully we can uh, dig in, roll up our sleeves, dig in and, and continue to, to hopefully make changes here. So thank you and I yield back. Thank you, uh, gentleman from New York, Mr. Espriot. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. Coles, uh, the Build Back Better uh, Act provides major investment in national service, obviously, and it includes $7 billion to establish civilian, a civilian climate corps with over half of the funding, which is a total of $15.2 billion, uh, funneled through um, the AmeriCorps agency. Uh, this is a, a timely and much needed program that will help combat the climate crisis and create green jobs on our road to net zero. What are some of your plans to guarantee that the agency, the agencies and organizations in frontline communities like my district are awarded funding to make national service a more equitable opportunity for all Americans? Uh, I am concerned about those communities that have 
uh, been hurt the most by climate change, but yet contribute less to the problem, not accessing the dollars to um, their, their just fair share of the dollars to remediate some of those problems. What, are, what is your strategy or your plan to address that? Uh, thank you very much for your, your question, uh, Congressman. Uh, you're right, the, the BBB provides unique opportunities for us, particularly and intentionally, we will be extending uh, in a very assertive way our outreach to communities and individuals historically who have not had access to national service uh, for their programming. Uh, that as well is integrated into the BBB, that outreach capacity is stated there clearly, and it's also funded. And we take that charge seriously because equal opportunity and equity uh, is, is a just great consideration and concern to the administration, and we share that fully. So you can, you can be assured that we're going to, to take that on with great assertion. So we're looking forward to doing that. Uh, and I might also mention that, as I did before, in the, in the BBB, there is uh, over a 10-year period a commitment of funding to strengthen our agency staffing, technology upgrades, and other critical support functions. Uh, and that will go hand in hand uh, with our, our capacity to extend the reach, if you will, of national service to communities and individuals who historically have not been able to take advantage of it. So I have, a, uh, Mr. Coles, a, a permanent parking lot in my district. It goes, cuts right through the middle of my district. It's called the Cross Bronx Expressway. And uh, of course, uh, it contributes to probably the worst quality of air in the entire city of New York and some of the highest uh, asthma rates in the country uh, and uh, contributing also to uh, respiratory uh, problems for seniors and alike. And so what you're saying is that you will uh, recruit from those neighborhoods and you will ensure that a, a significant portion of that budget will be uh, spent in those particular neighborhoods? We are dedicated to the proposition that we are going to do significant outreach to ensure that historically underrepresented communities have greater access, particularly on the, the, the BBB uh, Civilian Climate Corps. That's, that's a, a charge that we take seriously. Uh, and it's a type of programming that we've experienced in the past that we plan to expand upon as well. Mr. Chairman, uh, I hope that uh, we work uh, together uh, as a committee uh, to ensure that these practices are implemented and that in fact, uh, those neighborhoods that have been left back for so long, uh, that have maybe been outreach, but in many cases, some of them may not have the infrastructure. They may not even have the organizations to, to put in place some of these initiatives that those neighborhoods are not left behind again. I think uh, if we are gonna combat uh, global warming and, and this climate crisis, and if we are gonna make sure that this uh, program, this new initiative uh, uh, will be successful, the Civilian Climate Corp, we must ensure that the dollars reach those neighborhoods and that the young people there, um, folks in general, are engaged, not just rec uh, recruited. We can try to recruit, but sometimes those neighborhoods suffer from chronic disadvantages that leave them out in terms of the infrastructure that's needed to put those programs in place. Thank will you. Thank you. Will the gentleman yield? Will the gentleman yes. yield? Uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, we should uh, warn uh, Mr. Coles that this may, uh, may be an area for oversight. Uh, it's a 10 year program. And we would want to ensure that the um, people in those districts are, in fact, the ones uh, getting many of the opportunities. So um, uh, we'll, we'll be following through on that. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. Thank, thank you. Um, you the um, gentlelady from California, Ms. Steele. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If the Build Back Better Act becomes law, it will include $15 billion more in taxpayer funds for AmeriCorps. We haven't seen issues with this program in my own state of California. And last year, the University of San Francisco agreed to pay over $2.5 million to settle fraud allegations. From 2014 to 2016, the university used 
fraudulent claims to obtain federal grant money from the AmeriCorps state and national program. Taxpayers need to know that their hard earned money is not being abused by fraud. So I wanna ask a few questions to uh, Ms. Jeffrey. Do you, are you familiar with the settlement with the University of San Francisco? If you do, that is that really true that University of San, San Francisco agreed to pay $2.5 million for fraud claims? And I just wanna know it's correct or not. And how this fraud uncovered, was it through oversight by uh, Corporation for National and Community Services or under your investigation? So it is correct that uh, the University of San Francisco Teacher Residency Program uh, paid basically two and a half million dollars to settle claims that it was um, uh, submitting timesheets for services that weren't performed, that is falsifying timesheets, and then falsely certifying education awards. Um, this came to our attention by a whistleblower, um, somebody who, in this case, blows the whistle for a finder's fee. Um, and then the United States has an opportunity to come in and take over that case. So we were asked to investigate it. We found that all of the allegations were very, very well supported. Um, and the U.S. Attorney's Office in San Francisco pursued the case to recover those funds. Thank you for that answer. So once the whistleblower comes forward, how long it does it take to complete an investigation? And what happens to the grants they have while that investigation is happening? Does CNCS taken any action while accusation is investigated and these schools still getting paid? So as with the answer to most legal questions, it depends. Um, how long it takes depends on how complicated the allegations are, that is how much work it takes to investigate. In this case, um, there was so much turnover in the US Attorney's Office that the case took longer than it should have to pursue. Um, that they, they, we work closely with the agency so that when we become aware of fraud that is happening on a current basis, we ask the agency to suspend further funding to that grantee to stop the bleeding. We can't do it all the time, but whenever we can, we go to the agency and make that request. And I'm not aware of any time when the agency has declined to do that, that we have requested it. Okay, so uh, with this this case, because the whistleblower that you know we found out there is a fraudulent claim, and they got the money, and we found out. Uh, so it's gonna it's very tough to find out because all these timesheets, and then you can get what kind of investigation you do uh, to find out, and how often you do for these universities or other nonprofit organizations, and how do you get into that and What's the percentage of this uh, uh, this kind of like a, you know fraud cases coming out when you investigate without whistle, whistleblowers? So I wish I could give you an overall percentage. Um, the fact is that my investigative staff is too small to investigate all of the matters that come to our attention. And we have recently increased our investigative staff and we still have a backlog of leads. There are, in addition to the calls we get from whistleblowers, occasionally an organization will itself discover that someone has committed fraud and the organization will self-disclose and we encourage that. Um, a lot of times we can do uh, what's called data analytics and we can look at certain patterns of payment and we could say, this is suspicious. We want to make some inquiries here. Sometimes we find this fraud because we're already doing an audit of these grants. And in the process of auditing, we discover information that shows fraud has occurred. So there are many different ways this comes to our attention. I want to ask more, but uh, Mr. Chairman, I know my time is up, so I yield back. Uh, thank you. Gentle lady from Louisiana, Ms. Ledlow. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, Mr. Coles and Ms. Jeffrey, thank you for taking the time to testify before the committee today. There are several good AmeriCorps programs that benefit Louisiana's 5th District. In fact, every year my state faces hurricane season, which can cause significant damage to our communities. This year was no different and Louisiana faced a category four storm with Hurricane Ida. I recognize and appreciate that over the years, AmeriCorps teams have been deployed to Louisiana to assist with disaster recovery and cleanup, which is helpful to communities that have been hard hit by natural disasters. While I appreciate that help, we're here today to discuss the latest Inspector General audit report released a few weeks ago. Unfortunately, the IG has not been able to complete a comprehensive financial report because the corporation has been unable to produce auditable financial material. It is my understanding that this has been the case for the past five years. I find this very troubling. If an agency is unable to adequately account for the funding it receives, serious reform needs to be considered and implemented. It is important to address and improve upon these concerns, so taxpayer dollars are used wisely, appropriately, and efficiently. Ms. Jeffrey, in June 2014, the OIG released its report on AmeriCorps audit of blanket purchase agreements for professional consulting services, which found AmeriCorps engaged in a, quote, shocking waste of taxpayer funds, lax oversight, and widespread noncompliance, unquote, with rules and regulations. My questions are more general in nature, but I think it's important to understand the overall picture of what is going on at AmeriCorps. Do you believe AmeriCorps has been irresponsible with taxpayer funds? And do you believe AmeriCorps is continuing to be irresponsible with taxpayer funds? I think AmeriCorps has not properly been scrutinizing in the procurement area, not properly been scrutinizing the personal services contracts um, to look at the invoices and see, are people actually providing the services we're paying them for? So sometimes they pay a summary invoice and they don't ask for the backup, which shows everybody's timesheets. You want to see that backup because often people are working on multiple projects and you want to make sure they aren't representing that they're working more than 100% of the time. That's a classic way to commit fraud and you will never know it unless you look at the comprehensive timesheets. Sure. Thank you. That segues into my next question. Do you believe AmeriCorps faces a lack of oversight? Um, well, I guess it depends what you mean by oversight. Let me just say again, my office is very small. If we had a larger budget, we could provide greater oversight. There are a lot of oversight activities we know need to be done, uh, but we are prioritizing and making choices. Sure, and finally, do you believe AmeriCorps struggles to comply with the rules and regulations prescribed in the law? Uh, I think it varies according to what the rule and regulation is, but there are certainly some that the agency would acknowledge it hasn't complied with. Uh, we were told earlier this year that the agency knew it wasn't meeting its obligation to follow up on single audit reports. Uh, and the agency told us that and said it was something they wanted to work on. We appreciated them acknowledging it. So we didn't have to ferret that out. Um, I think there are other areas in procurement where we know there were challenges to compliance, and that is one of the reasons that the agency has outsourced that function to uh, the Treasury Department. Thank you so much for your time, Ms. Jeffrey. I yield back to Ranking Member Dr. Fox. Thank you very much, Ms. Letlow. I appreciate it. Uh, I want to follow up a little bit more on what you were saying with uh, Ms. Jeffrey. Ms. Jeffrey, since you've been with the agency, how much fraud have you uncovered in AmeriCorps? So what I can tell you about and what we, we track in bulk um, are the major civil and criminal cases that we've done. Since 2019, um, we have recovered $4.8 million in civil settlements. Plus we have gotten uh, a criminal restitution order of $527,000. Again, if I had more people, those numbers would be higher. It takes a long time to investigate these cases. So have you only been with the IG for a short time? I was under the impression you'd been there a long time. So you're only talking I about 2018. Well, I'm talking about 2019 to the current time because that's when we started a large emphasis on going after, going after fraud civilly. 
Before that, I did come to the agency in 2012. Before that, we didn't have the capacity to take on those large, complicated cases. So we handled mostly smaller matters and we handled them administratively. It was also early on very difficult to get prosecutors to agree to prosecute our cases. Now with our increased um, capacity, and with the body of work we've built up, we don't have any trouble getting prosecutors to agree to take our cases. Uh, thank you. And I thank uh, the lady from Louisiana for yielding time. Thank you. The gentlelady's time has expired. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Cawthon. Thank you very much, Chairman. And uh, Dr. Fox, ranking member, thank you very much for your leadership in this committee. Uh, Ms. Jeffries, I'd like to ask a question of you, and my question refers to faith in institutions, uh, a major part of the strength of this country. You know, our country, our government only works because ordinary citizens believe that those in positions of delegated authority are not taking advantage of them and using the fruits of their labor uh, responsibly. In your testimony, you refer to numerous weaknesses and deficiencies in AmeriCorps that have been found over the years. These deficiencies have rendered AmeriCorps unable to be transparent with the American people. Many of them remain un unresolved. How do you think Americans should feel about such an outrageous lack of transparency? I, I mean, I think it is profoundly disturbing. It has been profoundly disturbing to us uh, that the agency has not treated this with the urgency that we believe it requires and um, that we are basically reporting the same findings year after year after year. It's like that movie Groundhog Day. I mean, the reports <sighs> basically write themselves at this point. Gosh, I, I cannot imagine how frustrating it is to be in, in your position having to deal with that. Um, now, listening to you over the past couple of hours, you've expressed some optimism, optimism on changes to the agency. Um, I think, and I really and others, our right to be skeptical based on prior experiences. Based on AmeriCorps' history, what reason do we have to believe that we are not just throwing good money that's following bad money? Uh, that is a very reasonable question. Um, I think if you talk to the agency, you would find that in their view, I'm not much of an optimist. I'm pretty skeptical. <laughs> uh, the reasons that I am somewhat more optimistic now is because there are resources that are coming to the agency from external sources. And I think in particular, the support of the Technology Modernization Fund really will provide some structure and a much greater um, certainty that the agency is gonna get something for what it spends on technology. That hasn't been the case in the past. Now I think the, that that is a condition for success. Let me say it that way. Well, that's great to hear. So just one follow-up question, you know, as a member of Congress and this entire body and this committee, you know, really the, the real remedies that we have at our disposal are either defunding or increased oversight. Um, but do you think of any other remedies that we can enact as Congress and members of Congress to be able to support you and make AmeriCorps more transparent? Well, you can always give us more money. Um, <laughs> that, you know, that is really a limiting factor in our oversight. Um, we greatly appreciate the support that we've gotten and the increases that we've gotten to our budget. And indeed, the Build Back Better Act um, would resource my office uh, considerably. Um, but it takes a lot of time and effort to investigate and to do these audits in a way that produces change. And the more people we have, the greater the impact we can have. We usually find that grantees, when we do an audit, they are concerned and they want to fix things um, and they do their damnedest to fix them because they understand the consequences of not doing so are very serious. It's the same with our investigations. Now that we've got traction with prosecutors, we don't have any trouble getting prosecutors to accept a good case. And in fact, we often pursue small cases because of the the um, educational mission that that has uh, and the way it informs the grantee community about what the expectations are and the standards they'll be held to. And I'm very pleased to say that prosecutors throughout the United States are supportive of that mission and it makes a difference. Oh, that's great. Well, Ms. Jeffries, I can tell that we're birds of a feather, so I, I really appreciate your service for our nation and, and doing what you're doing. Uh, but I, I would yield any remaining time I have to Dr. Fox if you'd like to consume it. 
Okay, with that, then I yield back. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, sorry. Never mind. Uh, pursue that just a little bit. You no, mentioned. Dr. Bucks, Dr. Bucks, you're going to be next to be recognized. So, why don't we just add okay. a minute to your time? Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, I appreciate uh, that. The uh, gentlelady from North Carolina, the ranking member, is recognized for six minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. That's very kind. Uh, Ms. Jeffrey, let me pursue a little bit about what uh, Mr. Cawthorn was asking. Uh, and I appreciate you, you're, you've alluded to this before. You mentioned, I was going to ask you, is the fraud mostly in the large national grantees or simply across the board? So we have found fraud in the large grantees or in the, um, the state commissions, but a lot of it occurs at the subrecipient level. And so that happens with smaller grantees. Uh, nobody's immune from fraud. It happens at all levels. Right. And, you know, there, there's been a lot of excuses made for the fact that these, quote, small grantees, let's say, what is the smallest grantee? Do you have an idea what that is? There there are some grantees in the AmeriCorps Seniors Program that, if memory serves, get about $40,000. For Okay. Well, that's pretty small. Well, I know that's agents, small. there are, there are. Uh, humane societies, there are arts councils, there are all kinds of groups in our communities run by volunteers that don't seem to have the same problem that the people who are getting taxpayer dollars are having. So it makes no sense to me to give an excuse to them for saying they don't have systems set up because there are lots of groups out there that have less money and account for it every year with clean audits. I, so there's, it seems to me there is a systemic problem here that's an abuse of taxpayer dollars all the way around. So can I, can, you, I, I can tell you, Dr. Fox, that fraud in the nonprofit sector is a major concern. Um, and that's not limited to AmeriCorps grantees. Um, there is a lot of fraud that takes place, typically in the form of conflicts of interest or related party transactions. And so it doesn't often get reported because it is very hard to detect, especially when you have a completely volunteer run system. Uh, but I'm not sure the nonprofit sector is, is sort of quite as um, clean living as we might like to think. Well, it seems to be that way in the communities I represent. Now, I want to go, I mean, but, but again, you had the University of San Francisco have to pay back $4.8 million. That's not a small organization. We had two public universities in North Carolina mm -hmm. and the North Carolina Commission, and they had to pay back $842,500. So these are not small organizations Correct. that don't have systems set up. So who paid that settlement of $842,500 uh, from North Carolina? It, because these are public institutions, it comes out of the pockets of the taxpayers. So the taxpayers are paying for it wherever they are, it seems to me. So we've got rampant fraud and rampant misuse of funds, and it's always the taxpayers who are paying for it. Um, I, you've already said that if you had more staff, you could do a better job of that. And I think that that certainly should be where, if we're going to have money spent, that's where it should go, into all the IG's offices, so that we can have better accountability. I don't believe that we should be paying volunteers to be doing things. And that's another problem that we have. So we will have in our group, I appreciate what Mr. Fitzpatrick said earlier uh, about wanting to work with the Democrats, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I do away with this program. I'm like Mr. Good, I would do completely away with it and I'll do everything in my power to do so. However, Mr. Chairman, I would think that because you all support this program so much that at least you'd want the money to go where it should be going. And I, I hope again, Ms. Jeffrey, 
you said this program has so completely failed and it started failing almost from the beginning. Isn't that correct? I think the financial management was flawed from the beginning. From the beginning. So there's been a lot of picking on the last two years uh, or last three years. And yet the, I assume the 2017 audit was based on 2016 activities. Is that correct? Uh, the 2017 audit audits fiscal year 2017. Okay, which which would have had been set up, and most of the people there would have been coming from the previous administration. And yeah, there's you, not there's there's not a lot of turnover in the workforce um, when an administration changes. The turnover right. happens at the leadership level. Sure, and and yet we've been told that. Uh, uh, a lot of people left, 100 people left, and that that hamstrung the agency. I'm so, not sure how did that happen. So those rifts happened when the agency undertook its reorganization, uh, principally in 2018, 2019, 2020, when it closed all of the state offices, consolidated into eight regions, um, and uh, because the agency felt that it couldn't support the size workforce it had with the administrative budget that it then had. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I get back. Thank you. Um, I remind my colleagues that pursuant to committee practice materials for submission to the record must be submitted to the committee to the committee clerk within 14 days following the last day of the hearing, which would be close of business December 15th, preferably in Microsoft Word format. The material submitted must address the subject matter of the hearing, only a member of Congress or an invited witness may submit materials for inclusion in the hearing record. Documents are limited to 50 pages each. Documents longer than 50 pages will be incorporated into the record by way of an internet link that, must, that you must provide to the committee clerk within the required time frame, but please recognize that in the future, that link may not, um, uh, may not always work. Uh, pursuant to house uh, rules and regulations, items of the record should be submitted to the clerk electronically by emailing submissions to edandlabor.hearings at mail.house.gov. Again, I wanna thank our witnesses for their participation today. Members of Congress may have additional questions for you. And we ask you to please respond to these questions in writing. Hearing record will be held open for 14 days in order to receive those responses. And I would remind our colleagues that pursuant to committee practice, witness questions for the hearing record must be submitted to the majority committee staff or committee clerk within seven days. Questions submitted must address the subject matter of the hearing. Um, I would now recognize the distinguished ranking member for any closing statement she may wanna make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I appreciated the hearing today because I think it brought to light one more time the real concerns that everybody should have over this program. Uh, I, I frankly don't think that the, the benefits um, are there for the amount of taxpayer dollars that we put into this program. I'm going to submit some questions uh, that I would like to be asked, um, like how many times has the IG recommended criminal or civil proceedings that, that have not been followed up on, because I don't think we have a real sense of the scope of the fraud and abuse and the illegal activity. But as I said to you in my comments before, if, if there is any uh, plan to try to keep this program alive, and I would think that Democrats who have been exposed now to all this information today and we had good participation, you would at least want the money to go where it's supposed to go. And I do believe that when the American people understand that this program is going to fund the Civilian Climate Corps, you are going to see some tremendous resistance against this program because this is something the American people don't want in this country. I don't believe they want people telling them how to live their lives 
as far as climate is concerned, whether they should turn down their thermostat or what kinds of things they should be doing. And so I would seriously urge you to consider taking that out of any kind of a program you want to support. Uh, I'm all for, in favor of helping people uh, get good experiences uh, when they're young people. There are many people in the country who would like to see us have a service program for everybody in the country. You could go to military service or do something for the community. But I don't believe that's what most people have in mind. But thank you very much for holding the hearing and for exposing all of the bad stuff that we've heard about these programs. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I now recognize myself for the purpose of making my closing statement. As the Committee on Education and Labor meets today, we cannot ignore the tragedy yesterday in Michigan in which four children were killed. Uh, reports are that one, addition, one child passed this morning. Four children were killed and seven injured by gun violence. At another situation in Tennessee last night after a school basketball game involving one fatality and multiple injuries, uh, this committee has reported uh, legislation in the past uh, dealing with gun violence and will continue. It did not become law that will continue uh, to make efforts to try to reduce gun violence. But I want to thank our witnesses for your time and expertise. Today, we reflected on AmeriCorps' decades-long service to neighborhoods across the nation and importance of strengthening its accountability and grantee management. AmeriCorps has been essential in uplifting communities out of disaster, especially throughout the coronavirus pandemic, while also serving as an engine for economic mobility for thousands of AmeriCorps, hundreds of thousands of AmeriCorps uh, members. This is one reason why the House passed the American Rescue Plan and Build Back Better Act, which provides what we believe to be sufficient uh, funding uh, to, in both personnel and equipment to help AmeriCorps address its ongoing challenges and to expand its capacity and deliver on its mission to bring Americans together through service. And this hearing, hearing has brought attention to the urgency of developing a CAP, the correction, a Corrective Action Plan, in each of the outstanding 73 recommendations. CAPs have the advantage of establishing clear, quantifiable, objective, uh, objective uh, measurements by which the committee can uh, determine whether progress is being made on each of the recommendations. Uh, Mr. Coles, um, you didn't cause this mess, but we're counting on you to uh, clean it up because you know, if it's not cleaned up quickly, uh, you can imagine that AmeriCorps may well lose its um, strong bipartisan support that it usually enjoys. Um, I look forward to continuing our committee's oversight role and ensuring our investments being used being, uh, being used properly and effectively to meet the needs of our communities. And I want to thank um, Ms. Jeffries and Mr. Cole for your time today. If there's no further business to come before the committee, without objections, committee stands adjourned. Thank you very much.